Welcome everyone. We have another session on um, transfer pricing today. Um, as mentioned, today is the last uh, lecture that we have on transfer pricing, and I have a few issues um, in transfer pricing for you. The uh, you know the um, topics that we will be discussing today are these. But before that, um, you know, let's have the rules as the same that we've been doing in the last two um, you know lectures. So um, if you have any question relating to a particular topic that I'm discussing, please post your questions in the chat box and I'll take them. I'll take those questions as and when I'm delivering that particular and I'm talking about that particular topic. So we'll take the questions as and when. Um, because this is the last lecture on transfer pricing, if you have any questions on the entire topic, please feel free to reach out to me or you can post your question there as well. I don't mind extending the lecture by a few um, you know, minutes going forward um, and I'll take your, your questions on the entire syllabus today itself. So this is how we start with, um, uh, you know, the last lecture on transfer pricing. And these are the topics that I have for today. So we will be discussing something called a specified domestic transaction. If you guys remember the first lecture, we discussed SDTs um, in a very, very small, um, uh, you know, statement and in a, uh, you know, in a very um, concise manner. Today, we will be discussing specified domestic transactions um, in a lot of detail. So I'm going to talk about what exactly are specified domestic transactions. If you remember, um, this is where we talk about domestic transfer pricing in India. India. And it's not there in many nations, but the, it's there in India. And hence, we'll be discussing uh, specified domestic transactions. Then I will be talking about transfer pricing documentation. So you must have heard of, you know, something called Form 3CEB, Accountant's Report. You must have heard of something called TP Study. Then there's something called CBCR, Master File. So we'll be discussing all these terms in something called transfer pricing documentation. Transfer pricing documentation is basically, um, you know, the compliances that we have under transfer pricing in India. Uh, then we'll discuss transfer pricing dispute resolution. So within that, we will be talking about, um, you know, what happens if a case is there with the AO, when can the AO transfer that case to the TPO, TPO meaning the transfer pricing officer. And then we will be talking about some alternative dispute resolution mechanisms, which are called um, you know, safe harbor rules, there's something called advanced pricing agreements, APAs, etc. So I'm going to, you know, talk about what exactly are, um, you know, safe harbor rules, what exactly is APA, etc. Then there is, um, uh, you know, a separate topic, which is called secondary adjustment, primary and secondary adjustment, we'll be discussing this. And then um, we have some specific topics, which are limitation of intro on interest deduction. So, uh, you know, the interest that is available um, on interest. Um, deduction which is available on interest under section 94b is actually limited uh, to 30 percent of something and i'm going to talk about what exactly is it limited to so we'll discuss a separate topic on this and finally we will be discussing the penalties under transfer pricing so now please note that when it comes to penalties under transfer pricing i'm sure you've done another lecture on penalties uh altogether but uh, these penalties are very, very specific to transfer pricing. So these are over and above those particular penalties, but these are very, very specific to transfer pricing. So we, we'll, I will be discussing only penalties that are very restricted to this particular concept of transfer pricing. Um, at the same time, I'd just like to tell you that, uh, you know, do not skip the ICAI manual, the study manual at all, um, you know, go through those as well. While I've, you know, put a lot of things in the PPT, but still, um, you know, this cannot substitute the ICAI study manual. If you look at the study manual and when we discuss transfer pricing documentation as an instance, for example, you will see that there are a lot of definitions that are provided in the manual. So you need to actually correlate that with this particular PPT so as to see how a documentation is actually done. Although I will be covering a lot, um, you know, out here, but still, uh, please go through, uh, you know, the study manual as well. Uh, before I actually start with today's lecture, I'd just like to ask if there are any, um, you know, doubts that you have from, uh, you know, the previous lectures from, you know, the introduction class or, you know, the last lecture that we did on transfer pricing methods. Um, if you have any questions, please post them in the chat box. And um, if there are no questions, um, I'd just like to start with the lecture today.
and you know if everything is clear also just please put it there because it's very important the last lecture is actually forming base to this particular uh, lecture also so if you have any questions i'd like to address them uh, right now uh okay it says ppt notes of last class not shown in the portal um i had uploaded a ppt uh, a pdf version i'll still check after um you know the lecture today so what i'll do is i'll again upload um the ppt pdf of this particular lecture and the last lecture i'll upload this uh, um you know around 9 uh, 9:30 when we finish the lecture today i'll just do it at 9 9:30 today any other questions okay great so what we have for today is you know the first topic which is specified domestic transactions sdt is what we call it in um, uh, you know short this is coming from section 94 ba and i've already given you a gist that you know all this while we've been talking about transfer pricing being applied to something called an international transactions but you know in nations like um, um, you know india we have transfer pricing being affected on um, uh, you know domestic transactions also and that is basically called specified domestic transactions so transfer pricing being applicable on domestic transactions that is basically specified domestic transactions so if you guys remember we've been discussing all this while that you know the section 92 and it says that you know if there's an international transaction then you'll have to make sure that that international transaction action is agreeing is happening at something called arms length price so if you go back to you know the first lecture we were discussing this uh, you know case study of india and singapore how profits if you remember how profits were shifted from india to singapore and that is because india was a high tax jurisdiction and singapore was a low tax jurisdiction so essentially there was shifting of profits from a high tax jurisdiction to a low tax jurisdiction so that if you look at you know the profits of the group as a whole they are kept at the minimum the thing is that you know this kind of uh, situation can also happen in case of this kind of tax arbitrage can also happen in case of domestic transactions when i say domestic transactions maybe it is two entities within india itself how can that happen within two entities in india well it can happen if you have heard of something called tax holiday units or dtas um domestic tariff areas so and non uh, domestic tariff areas so it basically means that you know if there is a particular um uh, you know company in india and it has a lot of entities in india now one entity is actually claiming a tax holiday um, uh, you know under the income tax act or one entity is say for example in a special economic zone by being in a special economic zone they are exempt from profits so you know for a block of a few years no profit 100% tax exemption um, uh, you know is actually given on profits so what people can do in that particular instance is to transfer the goods from the dta or from the area which is not under tax holiday to the area which is under tax holiday and that is how that is more like you know shifting profits or transferring the goods um you know to a tax holiday unit from a high tax jurisdiction or you know from a high tax uh, unit to a tax unit where there is no uh, you know taxation or um, you know there is minimum taxation so that is basically the reason why they came up with um, you know the concept of uh, specified domestic transactions it was you know the supreme court in glaxo smith klein actually came up with the concept of uh, specified domestic transactions and this is the reason so as to make sure that there is you know even when there is domestic related party transactions and to make sure that there is objectivity in domestic related party transactions they came up with the concept of uh, specified domestic transactions so basically you know the finance act 2012 you can say they basically increased the scope of transfer pricing and they said that transfer pricing will now be applicable domestically also 
uh domestically when i say domestically it basically means that transfer pricing will be applicable on specified domestic transactions and it started happening from the financial year 2012 to 2013 now i'm going to talk about what exactly are the transactions which are under the scope of sdts because there was an amendment that actually came in in this particular aspect so in this particular slide, what I'm really trying to say is that, yes, transfer pricing in India is applicable domestically also, but it's applicable on units that are claiming these tax holiday units uh, that are claiming the tax holidays under different sections, which have been listed in the next slide. So if there is an entity which is claiming a, a, you know, a tax holiday or which is claiming a tax deduction under any of the sections and those particular entities deal with other entities which are paying taxation at the normal rates, well, then um, transfer pricing is applicable. So what they're really trying to say is that so that there is no transfer of profits, um, you know, not naturally, there is no transfer of profit from the entity which is paying tax to the entity which is not uh, paying tax because it's claiming tax deduction. So that that does not happen. Uh, they came up with transfer pricing on uh, domestic transactions. But then you have to remember that it is again between related party transactions. So if I'm talking about a company which has two units, obviously the two units will be connected to each other. So the term that they use under section 92 BA on specified domestic transactions, the term that they use is called close connection. I'm going to talk about that, uh, you know, going forward, but that's really the crux of specified domestic transactions. So the point is that, um, you know, specified domestic transactions, what are the transactions on which it is applicable? Well, before I actually go to the, you know, uh, transactions on which is it, it is applicable, let's read through section 92 BA. Now, if you read through section 92 BA, it says, for the purpose of section 92, 92C, which is on computation of arm's length price, 92D, which is, uh, you know, transfer pricing documentation, and 92E, which is, I'm going to talk about that, which is form 3CEB. In case of an assessee, the specified domestic transaction will mean all these transactions. What they're trying to say by putting in these particular terms, which is for the purpose of 92, 92C, 92D, 92E, what they're really trying to say is that, you know, the concept of um, uh, determination of arm's length price under specified domestic transaction, it's going to be the same as the concept of computation of arm's length price under international transaction. Meaning to say that if, you know, for international transaction, we were using the concept of arm's length price, that arm's length price concept also remains the same for specified domestic transaction. Meaning to say that if, you know, for the purposes of calculation of arm's length price for international transactions, we were using those six methods, then those six methods are also applicable for finding out ALP for specified domestic transactions. Meaning to say that if for... Um, the purposes of international transaction, we have a TP study and we have a Form 3CEB, then they try to say that this Form 3CEB and this TP study is also applicable for specified domestic transactions. Again, meaning to say that if Form 3CEB and, you know, other documents, uh, you know, are applicable for international transactions, in the same way, they are applicable for specified domestic transactions. So, meaning to say that the compliance, if you see, and, you know, the calculation part of calculating the arm's length price, um, if this is how we do it for international transactions, it's going to, you know, be the same way for specified domestic transactions also. But the scope is a little beyond, you know, on how a, uh, a specified domestic transactions are applicable that is provided under this particular section, under section 92 BA. So they say that, you know, the moment that there are transactions which are referred to section 80A, there are transactions which are referred to 80A subsection 8, 80IA 10, uh, etc. These are the sections under which uh, specified domestic transactions will be applicable. If you go through the sections, they all talk about tax holiday. They all talk about, you know, having um, 
um, you know, having an entity in, say, for example, a special economic zone or any, uh, you know, area for that matter. And if that happens, then that particular entity will be, uh, uh, you know, claiming a tax holiday or a tax exemption and hence uh, a tax deduction. And then um, that is how these sections will basically operate. Similarly, if you look at section um, 115BAB, it talks about, um, uh, you know, the lower tax rate of 15% for companies which are engaged in manufacturing of certain goods in India, meaning to say that if you manufacture these particular goods, then there will be a tax rate, a lower tax rate of 15% that you will be paying, meaning to say that they're not paying taxes at the regular rate, which is there in the Income Tax Act, but they're paying uh, tax at a lower rate of 15%. And hence, there is an incentive for uh, you know people in the same group to actually move their profits from the entities which are paying tax at the regular rate two entities which are paying tax under 115 BAB, which is at the rate of 15%. Similarly, the same concept, uh, you know, goes for cooperative societies as uh, well. So these are really the transactions. And if you actually look through, through these particular sections, the essence of all these transactions is that these are the uh, entities which are claiming a tax holiday or a tax, uh, you know, exemption. There was a point in time, you know, this has been introduced uh, from 2017, but um, there is a point in time before 2017 that there was also another transaction referred here, which was uh, 40A to B. So it basically said that if there is any expenditure in respect of which payment has been made to a specified person, then that was also covered within the ambit of specified domestic transaction. But that has been removed with effect from financial year 1617. And hence, I've put it in um, red. Meaning to say that, you know, before 2017, they basically said that... Um, even if there were transactions with specified persons. So if you if you know that there was transactions, there are they, they happen sometimes with relatives. Sometimes there were transactions with um uh, uh you know in the same uh, in the same company, there was excessive salary that was being given to uh you know related persons, etc. So those were within the ambit of section 48 2B. And they removed that and they just said that specified domestic transactions is only going to be applicable now to uh, um, entities which are claiming tax holiday or which are in non-DTA, uh, you know, areas, basically. Another thing what happened was um, initially there was a threshold of five crore rupees for specified domestic transactions. So, you know, all the transactions which are covered under SDT, you have to actually club them together, look at, you know, what is the, add them together, the value. If the value is more than 5 crore rupees, then SDT provisions were applicable. But with effect from financial year 16-17, uh, they've increased the threshold also. And today, the threshold is 20 crore in one year. So now the present law is that you have to see what are the transactions that are within the ambit of this that I've highlighted here. What are the transactions within ATA, ATIA, ATIA 10, 115BAB, 115BAE? Aggregate those particular, the value of those particular transactions. If it is more than 20 crore rupees, only then SDTs, uh, you know, will be applicable in a particular year. And you know that if SDT is applicable, as in domestic transfer pricing is applicable, then you will have to make sure that all the compliance that we'll discuss going forward, all the compliance will have to uh, be managed, will have to be undertaken by the taxpayer. And they will have to make sure that the transactions with those particular entities is happening at something called arm's length price. How will you make sure that those transactions are happening at arm's length price? Well, you will just make use of section 92C, all the uh, you know methods that we discussed in the last lecture, and then make sure that they are happening at something called arm's length price. So that is how a uh, you know transaction relating to specified domestic transaction really occurs. Now the point is that you know what are is there a specific definition like we had a definition for associated enterprises, uh, you know, for international transactions. Who's going to tell me the section for AEs for international transaction? Please, if you can post it in the chat box. What was the section to determine AEs, associated enterprises for international transaction? What was the section under the Income Tax Act? Please post it on the group, uh, on the chat box. What was the section? That was uh, lecture one.
ओके वॉट वॉज द सेक्शन फॉर एसोसिएटेड एंटरप्राइजेस अंडर द absolutely the section was section 92a but within 92a if you guys remember there was 92a subsection 1 which talked about general uh, you know clauses and then there was section 92a subsection 2 which talked about those 13 instances so that was for international transactions that's absolutely correct um not 92b section 92b was for international transactions but section 92a a is for associated enterprises so uh, just like the way that we had international transactions ae ae for uh, sdts is provided in rule 10a but if you actually read through these particular um, uh, you know uh, definition under rule 10a you will see that they again talk about undertakings or businesses which are provided in 80 i 8 80 i 8 10 or you know um uh, these particular sections uh, 10 double a etc so you'll just you know in the essence it just says that the moment you have an enterprise which are claiming um uh you know exemptions um uh, under these particular uh, you know sections then they will become uh, an associated enterprise also what they actually look for close connection but the term close connection is uh, not really defined practically what we do is the moment that um, you know there is um, you know an entity and it has a lot of other entities in the same group and one entity is claiming tax exemption or not we know that sdt is basically uh, you know applicable uh, in that particular sense but essentially they just look at um, uh, you know entities or units or businesses or undertakings which are claiming these tax holiday uh, exemptions so essentially if you actually look at um, uh, you know the summary of um, how sdt is basically established it talks about an assessee now if this particular assessee has an eligible unit and it has any other unit when they say eligible unit it basically talks about units which are there under section 80i a 80a 80 10aa 115bae etc so now if this assessee has two units in india and one unit is actually transferring goods and services to the eligible unit then you know that transfer pricing will be applicable domestically within these particular two units of the same assessee in india and if transfer pricing provisions will be applicable uh, they will have to make sure that this is at alp but for this particular purpose you have to make sure that the value of the transaction between these two units is more than 20 crore rupees in one year another thing if there is an assessee and this assessee has an eligible business when they say eligible business it means the business which is eligible under section 92 ba as in the one which is claiming tax holiday and this eligible unit is actually uh, having a business transaction with any other assessee well then also any business transaction well then also you will have to make sure that these are happening at um, uh, you know arms length price but for this particular purpose also you will have to make sure that uh, the aggregate of the transaction is more than 20 crore rupees but what i've done is i have provided a very nice chart here and this chart can help you understand and remember what exactly are specified domestic transactions and you know what are the thresholds applicable etc and when sdts is basically applicable so we start with the st starting point is whether the assessee is claiming specified deductions or not if the assessee is not claiming specified deductions then obviously transfer pricing domestically will not happen so no then no domestic transfer pricing but then if we realize that yes assessee is claiming these specified deductions then then we'll have to make sure that whether the eligible unit whether they are entering into a transaction or not one with the eligible unit or with other persons who are having close connection if no transfer pricing is not applicable but if yes well then you'll have to make sure that uh, whether such transaction is considered as an international transaction or not if it is an international transaction then obviously domestic transfer pricing will not be applicable then um, international transfer pricing will be applicable so if no then um, you know you'll have to see that the aggregate value 
of such transactions exceeds 20 crore or not if yes well then you'll have to maintain information and documentation as per section 92d read with rules 10d and then report such transaction also in form 3ceb so now today i'm going to talk about what exactly is this documentation that has to be maintained and what exactly is this form 3ceb that has to be maintained but this is how um, you know a specified domestic transaction really works so first you have to see whether there is an eligible unit or not as in the specified deduction unit or not if yes then look at the transactions um you know if, if it has and then if the transactions are there then you'll have to make sure that the transactions aggregate value is more than 20 crores in one year if that is also there then you know that sdt provisions will be applicable and domestic and transfer pricing compliance will have to be undertaken okay is this better just uh, had a request to zoom into this particular diagram out here. Please let me know if there are any questions on this particular chart. Otherwise, in any case, I will be uploading this chart, um, you know, uh, right after the lecture today. Okay, let's move forward. Any questions here? Any questions on SDT? Otherwise, we move forward to the next topic, which is, you know, all this while I have been saying that, you know, there is a documentation that has been maintained. Just in SDT also, we discussed that there is a documentation that we need to be maintained. We um, There is, um, you know, um, um, uh, report that has to be submitted there's something called you know very casually people call something as a transfer pricing return that has to be you know undertaken etc so now we'll discuss what exactly are these particular things so what we have now is something called transfer pricing documentation now the thing is what is the importance of documentation well the documentation is important because we are uh, chartered accountants and compliance is very very important but no on a serious note what is the importance of transfer pricing documentation now this is the slide that talks about the importance of transfer pricing documentation um from the perspective of um uh, you know a diagram so it basically says that you know if MNEs, um, if multinational enterprises want to protect themselves from transfer pricing penalties uh, then they'll have to maintain something called a transfer pricing documentation why is that because if you remember all this while we discussed um, something called a transfer pricing analysis we discussed how um, you know the method was chosen then we discussed what was the database that we had chosen for coming up with those particular comparable companies then we were discussing that you know these were the filters that we applied to actually bring down the number of comparable companies now that is where documentation is important because you would want to substantiate to the transfer pricing officers that this is how in a very logical and streamlined manner we actually calculated the arm's length price or we actually selected the comparable companies so you have to substantiate it to the income tax authorities that listen this is not like you know on our whims and fancies this is not like an arbitrary uh, procedure that we had undertaken but it was a very streamlined and a logical manner of computing the arm's length price by using a particular software etc so that is how when you document all these things that is how um, you know uh, there is protection to these multinational enterprises from transfer pricing penalties so if you look at, uh, you know, transfer pricing uh, documentation in India, basically transfer pricing documentation is divided into two instances. And I'll, you know, give you a plus plus to this statement. But very basic statement is that there are two things that you need to do in India for transfer pricing documentation. But I'll change my statement going forward when I introduce a new concept. So effectively there are two things that you need to do for transfer pricing documentation one is have something called a transfer pricing study you must have heard of something called a tp study and the second thing is to have something called a transfer pricing return i'm using these words because these are generally used in the industry you know very casually but that is not really the uh, law terminology to these particular documentation so one is a tp study 
and the second one is a form 3CEB. It's also called an accountant's report and it's also called um, generally transfer pricing return. Now, the thing is, if you talk about form 3CEB, it's more like a, you know, like a document which has a set format which is given by the income tax authorities and just like any other return we file a transfer pricing return also if there is a, an international transaction or if there is a specified domestic transaction there are parts to it part uh, a is general information part b is uh, you know international transaction and then part c is specified domestic transaction i'm just giving you a brief overview i've written everything on the slide out here just giving you just you know you can listen right now because every Thing, what I'm saying is provided in the slides right here and I'm going to show you where it is provided etc so when you look at a form 3CEB it's more like you know uh, you know you can say um, an eight page document or something like that it's a very small document which just says information that you know uh, these are the international transactions and these are the associated enterprises and you have to submit that transfer pricing return uh, by the 31st of October to the income tax authorities but with the form, with the transfer pricing return, it's also called Form 3CEB. It's also called Accountant's Report. With that, there goes a very, very elaborate document, which is called a transfer pricing study. Now, a transfer pricing study is like a thick booklet kind of a, a you know document because it has a lot of information relating to how you computed the arm's length price. So there is a legal obligation one to maintain all this uh, you know documentation because it's provided in the law and there are strict penalties under transfer pricing if you do not submit these returns or you maintain this document and then it also you know if there is uh, um, you know, an assessment proceeding going forward, then also you can substantiate how you calculated that arms and price using those particular documentation that you have. So there is a dual purpose on why you maintain these particular documentation. We're going to talk about the first document, which is called the TP study or the transfer pricing study report which is out here. So this is coming from section 92D, but you have to read it with rule 10D of the income tax rules. Um, I have a request here to please repeat the chart. I am presuming that it is this particular chart. What I can do is let me finish with because I'm ongoing with documentation process. Let me finish with documentation and then I'm going to go back to SDTs and, um, you know, repeat that particular chart. But let's talk about, uh, uh, you know, the documentation right now. So as I was talking about, there is something called a TP study that is to be maintained. It is a very, very thick document. And it's a very, very thick document because it has a lot of information provided in the document. Now, the thing is, what are the information that are provided in that particular document? If you read the law, um, it talks about all this information in a very, very, um, you know, elaborate manner. But what I've done is I've divided them into three parts. And... Um, um, I've just shortened, uh, you know, the language a bit. So for the long language, you have to look at the law for the exact language. But I've just divided them into, you know, three parts on what exactly is provided in the TP study. So I've divided TP study into three parts. It's a one document, but I've just divided it into, you know, these three parts. The first is enterprise. So when I start with a TP study, uh, the TP study starts with, uh, you know, the ownership structure. So you have to say that in the TP study, you have to start by saying that, you know, this is my client, this, this private limited is my client. And then you have to say that this is the ownership structure of my client that, you know, my client is, say, for example, a parent company, and then it has subsidiaries in UK, it has subsidiaries in China, it has subsidiaries in USA, in Germany, or wherever for that particular manner. So you have to actually provide the ownership structure of the entire group uh, uh, that ways and then you also have to say that these are the associated enterprises of uh, 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 you know the group so how do you say well that these are associated enterprises well you'll have to refer to section 92a of the income tax act and then you have to say that you know by virtue of this particular section these entities are related to my client or my entity for which you are actually undertaking a transfer pricing study so you'll have to you know sh share um the ownership structure of the entire group. 
Next, you have to provide, uh, you know, the profile of the entire group. You'll have to give in detail that this is what my, uh, you know, client or my entity does. So you'll have to tell them whether they are a manufacturer, if they are a manufacturer, what is the kind of product that they manufacture. You'll have to put all the information that is, you know, given from the website. You'll have to do that in a very, very detailed manner. Then next, if you've described the AEs, the associated enterprises, you'll have to give the name of the AEs, you'll have to give the address of the AEs, where are they registered, you'll have to look at, you know, the country of their tax residence, and you'll also have to provide details of what the AE does. So you'll have to tell them that, you know, this particular AE does undertakes this particular function in this particular area. So then you'll have to give, uh, you know, the business, the entire business of the taxpayer, you'll have to talk about that, you'll have to talk about the business of, uh, uh, you know, the associated enterprise, and you'll also have to give an industry analysis. Now, industry analysis is given that, you know, this is the industry in which my entity operates, maybe this is a hospitality industry, maybe this is, um, you know, a medical industry, maybe this is automobile industry. So you'll have to tell how the industry is performing that way. So this is the first segment of that particular report. Now, in the second segment, after you have identified that, you know, these are the associated entities, uh, you know, to my client. Now, next thing you'll have to undertake is has the, are there any transactions with those associated enterprises? And then you'll have to list down those particular transactions that, you know, with AE1, these are the transactions. And then you'll also have to explain those particular transactions. So if you say that, you know, I've provided um, IT services to AE1, then you'll have to perform you'll have to say that what kind of information technology services have you, you know, performed? When did you perform those particular services? What was the quantum of those particular services? What is the amount that you're actually charging on those particular services? And then what is the value of those particular, you know, services? Then you will have to, after all these details, and you'll have to do that for all the transactions that have been undertaken, then you will have to get into something called a FAR analysis that, you know, what are the functions that are being performed? What are the kind of assets that you have and what are the risks that are being assumed by uh, those particular entities? Then you'll have to identify, uh, uh, you know, then you'll have to get into a computation kind of an analysis. Now, for each transaction that you've listed in the, you know, report in the study, you'll have to substantiate that, you know, for transaction one, this is the method that I feel is the best suited. And I'm going to take out the ALP using this particular method. So these are the details uh, uh, that you have to, uh, you know, perform. So you know, let's say for transaction one, you feel that, you know, the best method is transactional net margin method or TNMM is the best method for transaction one. So now, so as to say that, you know, TNMM is the best method, you'll have to cross other methods also. Meaning to say that if you feel that for transaction one, TNMM is the best method, then what you do is you, you tell them why CUP is not the best method. You also tell them why CPM is not the method. You have to tell them why RPM is not the best method. You have to tell them why PSM is not the best method. You have to tell them why other method is not the best method. And then tell them that TNMM is the best method. So meaning to say that to accept one method, you have to provide a reasoning to reject all those other methods, uh, you know, that ways. So that is just for transaction one. Then for transaction two also, what is the most appropriate method? Why are you rejecting other methods? Why are you selecting a particular method? You have to give all those kind of details. And then finally, if you're actually using TNMM and if you're using a particular database, those transfer pricing database that we discussed, and if you're using that particular database and you're calculating um, you know, the arm's length price by finding out comparable companies, then in that particular TP study or this particular document, you'll have to provide in that, uh, you know, this is the database that we've selected. When I selected the database, these were the number of companies. Then um, I filtered down the company using filter one, maybe quantity sorry, maybe quantitative filter, maybe a qualitative filter, et cetera. This is, this is how I came from 3000 companies, I came down to 11 companies. And for those particular 11 companies, how did you find the profit margin, et cetera? You'll have to make all those calculations in the TP study. And this is the reason TP study becomes so, so elaborate because you just understood, you know, the kind of information, the kind of details that we actually put in a transfer pricing study. And that is how it's a very, very thick document 
document substantiating and providing not just information relating to the AEs, not just information relating to the international transactions or specified domestic transactions, but also the mode of calculation of ALP, everything is provided in the TP study. Now, uh, the question is that who will make this particular documentation? Well, this documentation is uh, maintained by all the companies, uh, you know, in India who are undertaking international transaction. So if you have a company in India and it has transactions with AEs all across the world, um, or even if there is transaction with any other AE and this is an international transaction, then that particular company will have to maintain a transfer pricing study. This TP study is not just applicable in India, but even outside India, people, um, you know, jurisdiction have same rules. So the moment, as far as India is concerned, the moment you know that, you know, there is an Indian entity and this Indian entity has even one transaction with, you know, companies outside India or it has transactions with, uh, uh, you know, anyone, even in India if they are covered under SDTs and there are international transactions or there are specified domestic transactions, well, if these two conditions are established and you know that TP uh, transfer pricing is applicable, then this Indian entity will have to make a transfer pricing study uh, you know, report. The next question uh, is who should conduct the TP study and when should it be performed? Well, I'm going to address this question in the next slide. When should it be performed every year? Well, I'm going to talk about this in a lot of detail. So now you know that it is the Indian entity as far as Indian transfer pricing rules are concerned under section 92D that this Indian entity will have to maintain uh, a transfer pricing study as long as transfer pricing provisions are applicable or even if specified domestic transaction, uh, domestic transaction transfer pricing is applicable. The point is that, um, you know, this is a very, very interesting thing that if you actually look at section 92D, it says that, you know, if the aggregate value of international transaction exceeds one crore rupees, only then you need to make this detailed document, which is called TP study. So if the value of international transaction, so what you have to do is calculate all the international transactions with whatever AEs, See what is the value. If the value is more than one crore rupees, and honestly, in international transactions or you know in international transfer pricing, one crore rupees is not a very big deal. Uh, it's not a very high threshold. So the moment this threshold is more than one crore rupees, you will have to maintain something called a TP study. And, you know, TP study has to be maintained by uh, for a period of eight years by, you know, 31st October, etc. But... The point that is very, very interesting is that the law says, Section 92D read with Rule 10D says that you have to maintain the prescribed documentation. Now, the word of the law is that you have to maintain it. Now, every year that you need to maintain it, the income tax authorities do not say that, you know, you need to actually upload this transfer pricing study somewhere. You just have to maintain this study and keep it as part of, you know, the company records and, you know, the official records. You just have the requirement to actually maintain this transfer pricing study uh, for a period of eight years, every year that you need to maintain this transfer pricing study. So they basically say that, you know, every year you have to maintain this transfer pricing study. So year one, we have to undertake, uh, we have to maintain a transfer pricing study. We'll have to make this, uh, you know, elaborate document and then just keep it with us. And this has to be maintained every year because if you see, if you remember, we were doing this transfer pricing analysis and I was talking about comparable companies and, you know, that we have to calculate the margin of the comparable companies. So obviously, if we are undertaking the same exercise for year two, the margin of those comparable companies will change. And if you see, you know, we are doing this for year one, our transactions with our related party is at a particular number. This number or this transaction value might change in the other year uh, also. So the transfer pricing study has to be maintained every year. It's an exercise that you need to do every year if in transfer pricing is applicable. But maybe it could be a situation that year one, we have transactions with our related parties and uh, you know we are doing TP study, making a TP study. Now year two, maybe we do not have transactions with that particular AE and there is no requirement to do a TP study then. So it just depends if tran international transfer pricing is applicable or if domestic transfer pricing is applicable, um, then obviously you'll have to maintain a TP study every year. But the law also says that, uh, you know, 
if the nature of the transaction is the same, if everything is the same, that you do not need a fresh documentation every year. But at the same time, um, they say that the benchmarking analysis, you know, the computation analysis, it has to be changed every year. So you need to have those ready every year. Meaning to say that you need a tree study, um, you know, every year effectively, if international transfer pricing provisions are applicable. Um. <clears throat> Um, there's a question which is value of international transactions. I'm presuming that this is, uh, the, there is a question which is, which means value means arm's length price. Well, if I say the aggregate va book value of international transaction, that be, that does not mean arm's length price. That basically means that uh, the price which is there in the financial statement. So I'll give you an example. Let's say, that my client has undertaken uh, a transaction with its AE and the transaction value is 1 crore 20 uh, lakh rupees. Now, transfer pricing provisions will be applicable in this particular instance because, um, um, you know, the transaction value is there. It's more than 1 rupee. So even if the transaction value is more than 1 rupee, transfer pricing provisions will be applicable. The next step is whether I need to be maintaining TP study or not. Well, yes, I will be maintaining TP study. I will be getting into compliance. That is because um, the transaction value is 1 crore 20 lakh, which is exceeding, uh, you know, 1 crore. Now, the point is when I calculate the ALP, the ELP might be 1 crore 50 lakh rupees or the ALP might be something else. But because the aggregate value at which the transaction has taken place as per the financials of the company is 1 crore 20 lakh, that is the amount that I need to take into consideration. So I'm not concerned with ALP right now. I'm actually concerned with, uh, you know, what is the aggregate value or the book value, which is appearing obviously in the books of accounts. That is what you need to take into consideration uh, rather than the arm's length price. The arm's length price as it is, you know, is the second step. Only after you have established that it is exceeding the threshold, then you need to see, um, you know, whether, uh, then you need to see whether it is at ALP or not. But aggregate book value means the value which is appearing in the financial statements of the company. If the total transaction value is less than 20 crore, only for the full year, do we still need to do the study? No. If the transaction value, um, you know, you'll have to see at the end of the year. If the transaction value is, um, you know, less than 20 crores, then uh, you don't need to do uh, the study. But then 20 crore, um, you know, you need to do the study because 20 crore is the applicable uh, applicability, whether SDT will be applicable or not. So what I'm really trying to say is that you know, there are two segments to it. One is international transfer pricing. If international transfer pricing is applicable or not. Applic for applicability, you'll have to see, um, you know, whether the transaction value is more than even one rupee or not. If the transactions are there, then international transfer pricing will be applicable. The second thing is SDTs. For SDTs, is transfer pricing applicable or not? Well, if it is more than 20 crore rupees, then it will be applicable. Then after it is applicable, the next step is, do you need TP study or not? For that, whether it is international transaction or SDTs, the, the value is 1 crore rupees. You need TP study only if the transaction is more than 1 crore rupees. So 20 crore, the threshold limit is for applicability, whether transfer pricing is applicable or not. After the applicability is discovered, then you need to see whether compliance is needed or not. For compliance, you need to see 1 crore threshold. So this is what is provided here. The second thing that you need to do is with the TP study, as I mentioned, you also need to have something called a transfer pricing return. Now, the transfer pricing return is, uh, you know, needed the moment you have applicability. Now, if, um, you know, the transfer pricing return is a mandatory return or it's also called Form 3 CEB, it's also called um, accountant's report. The moment you know that there is transfer pricing applicable, 
for international transaction it is on the existence of transaction if it is a transaction of 1 rupee even then you will have to form a, a file a form 3 ceb or file the transfer pricing return for S sdts you will have to see whether it is more than 20 crore or not if it is more than 20 crore then you need to file form 3 ceb or um, the transfer pricing return so what i'm really trying to say is that transfer pricing return depends on the applicability um, in a particular situation if transfer pricing is applicable or not applicable transfer pricing return is to be filed uh, e-filing is there 31st october and this is basically a document which is given by chartered accountants only and this basically certifies that you know the transactions have been undertaken international transaction or specified domestic transaction they have been undertaken at something called uh, arm's length price so this is the certification that we as chartered accountants give um, for transfer pricing so this is what people generally call as transfer pricing return Um, as far as a transfer pricing return is concerned, a transfer pricing return, if you see a Form 3 CEB, it's divided into three sections. The first section is called Part A. In Part A, you need to, you know, you need to put in details. This is a very, very concise, you know, form. In Part 1, you need to put in the details of the AE, put the name of the AE, put the address of the AE, and the section, section 92A, which instance you feel that, um, you know, the entity is related to your client. So just need to put those particular details. Then part B is uh, international transaction. So it's going to just ask you that, you know, if you have international transaction, which AE do you have international transaction with? What is the area? What is the nature of transaction? What is the value of that particular, uh, you know, transaction? And which method have you adopted? It's going to just ask the name of the method and that's about it. Similarly, for uh, part C, which is SDTs, it's going to ask that, you know, what is the name of the AE? What is the nature of the transaction? What is the value of the transaction? And which method have you used to substantiate that this is at ALP? So that's about it. It's a very, very concise document. But the thing is that um, you need to file this particular, uh, you know, document, which is transfer pricing return. So you need to, just like we file all the other income tax returns, this is also a transfer pricing return that you need to file by the 31st of October with the income tax authorities. If you do not file it in time, there is a penalty of 1 lakh rupees. We'll be discussing that, uh, you know, later, but it is mandatory to e-file this particular document. So when it comes to documentation, primarily there are two things in India. One, you have to file a Form 3 CEB. The moment you know that there is in a transfer pricing applicable, you have to file, you have to mandatorily file Form 3 CEB. The moment you know that transfer pricing is applicable, um, filed again by the 31st of October. When you file it with the filing of income, uh, with the filing of transfer pricing return, you need to maintain a TP study. The TP study is this elaborate document I was talking about. But the thing is that you just need to maintain this TP study. But because this is a very, very elaborate document, the income tax authorities say that only if you have transactions more than 1 crore rupees, then only maintain it. But for Form 3 CEB, you have to file it irrespective of everything. The moment you have applicability, even if it is a 1 rupee transaction, then also you need to file Form 3 CEB. So these two things are, uh, you know, mandatory in India and they're provided in Rule 1092D. This is the transfer pricing documentation. So transfer pricing documentation in India is two things. Form 3 CEB, transfer pricing return, or and, sorry, and TP study, which is this elaborate document, TP study report. So these are the two things that have to be undertaken. Any questions here? Then I'll move to more documentation that we have in India. Okay. Any other question that I should address? Okay. Great. Now, what happened was that this is the documentation that was going on for the longest time. Now, if you see, the problem was that, um, you know, let's say that there is, um, you know, a multinational group. This multinational group is headquartered in India and then it has subsidiaries in USA, 
UK and say for example South Africa. So USA, UK and South Africa. There is an Indian entity and it has three subsidiaries, USA, UK and South Africa, just as an example. Now what happened was because transfer pricing provisions were applicable and there were you know multiple transactions within uh, all these uh, entities, etc. Now what happened was the Indian entity was supposed to file two things, one form 3CEB and a TP study. Now, these kind of, uh, you know, two things are there in almost all the countries. So even the USA entity had to file their form 3CEB or their transfer pricing return and, uh, you know, TP study. Then um, the UK entity is also, uh, you know, has that same requirement. The South Africa entity uh, has also the same requirement. Now, what happened was a lot of times the multinational group maybe did compliance in one uh, jurisdiction, but did not do compliance in other jurisdictions. And because it is a multinational enterprise, there was not exchange of information between, uh, you know, India and UK, India and USA, etc. There was a lot of discrepancy whether this multinational group has uh, you know, filed form in India, but have they done that in USA? Have they done that in UK? Have they done that in South Africa? So if the Indian entity has a transaction with USA, obviously they are filing compliances in India. But how do you get to know that they are filing compliances in USA? And if at all they're filing compliances in USA, how do you make sure that the transaction, because it's the same, it's at the same value that Indian entity has reported? How do you make sure that the USA entity has also reported the same value? Because, you know, you need exchange of information or you need that connection. So, so as to make sure, so as to make sure that, you know, this discrepancy is not there and every subsidiary is actually reporting transactions at the same value at, the, at what they have happened. And, you know, the there is consistency in these particular documentation. OECD came up with a three-tier documentation structure. So this is coming from OECD BEPS Action Plan 13. Um, you'll read more about this in the OECD BEPS Action Plans in International Taxation. But OECD came up with a resolution to this particular thing and they came up with Action Plan 13, which is three-tier documentation structure. So they said that, listen, the moment transfer pricing is applicable to you, you need to maintain three kind of documentation. So there are two that we're already doing in India. But they said that no three kind of documentation is required. They said that you'll have to maintain something called a master file. You'll have to maintain something called a local file. And then you'll have to maintain something called a country by country reporting. Now, what exactly are these three kind of documentation that are to be maintained, uh, you know, in India? The, this is provided in section 286. So OECD said that, listen, uh, you can incorporate, uh, uh, you know, these three documentation structures in India also. And accordingly, CBDT said that, yes, we will incorporate this. And they introduced three tier documentation structure in section 286 of the Income Tax Act. So now we'll talk about what exactly are these three tier documentation approach in India. But before that, any questions? Oh, if TP study, I have a question here. Uh, uh, what is what is the consequence if TP study report is not maintained? Well, in some instances, the penalty goes up to 200%. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that in this particular slide on what happens if you do not maintain all these study reports. So just give me some time. I'm going to come back to this particular slide also. Um, any other question? I have uh, another question, which is, should we file the TP study with any authority? Otherwise, how will they come to know? Exactly. So this was the reason why they came up with this three-tier documentation structure. Because, you know, the requirement to file uh, TP study is not there. They just say that you have to maintain the TP study. And, you know, when there are assessment proceedings, you need to produce it. They say that you just have to maintain it. So how do you know that, you know, this multinational enterprise, which is headquartered in India and it has USA, UK subsidiaries, how do you know that they have reported everything? You know, because you need to have good information. You need to have good communication with all these entities. And because there was no good communication, there was no exchange of information at that particular point in time, how do you get to know? How will the tax authorities even know uh, that, you know, how have you substantiated it? They just ask for a, they just ask for a form 3CEB and in form 3CEB, they, they don't know, they don't 
want uh, you know the calculation they just ask for the name of the method now how have i calculated that particular method how are the comparables used etc how will they get to know well now they will get to know because now we have detailed information requirement now we have detailed documentation requirement which is called the three tier approach which includes the master file local file and the country by country report so now i'm going to talk about this particular aspect Um, okay. So this is, uh, uh, you know, where we'll discuss what exactly is master file, what exactly is local file and what exactly is country by country reporting. So the first thing is, um, you know, something called the master file. If you look at, you know, something called a master file, it will just give an overview of uh, what the multinational group does. It's a very, very, you know, overall kind of, uh, 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 you know, document, which will just say that these are the objectives of the group. And it's not going to go into a lot of detail. It's going to just say that, you know, these are the objectives of the multinational group. These are the transfer pricing policies of this particular group, etc. But nothing more. It's more like a standardized document that you know even if there is a company headquartered in India and it has subsidiaries in USA UK they can just maintain one master file which is you know going to just talk about the group policies etc although they have to do that everywhere but they can just you know it's basically summarizing the group policies then there is something called a local file Local file basically means a file that has to be maintained in each jurisdiction. Now, in India, we already have a local file. The local file in India is called the TP study and the Form 3 CEB that we just discussed. So that is the local file that we have in India, the TP study in India and the Form 3 CEB in India. Now, the third thing and the most important thing that they introduced is something called a country by country report. A CBCR is what we actually call it. Now, the country by country report or the CBCR is basically a document that is going to give you jurisdiction wise information. This CBCR, I'm going to talk about this in detail also in the you know slides going forward. This is all about CBCR. All these slides are, you know, talking about CBCR. But CBCR, you know, basically says that this particular document is to be filed in the parent company's jurisdiction, in the parent entity's jurisdiction. So in our example, the parent entity is in India. Now, you have to file this particular document or the company has to file this particular document, CBCR, in the parent jurisdiction. That means in India. Now, what does it uh, you know contain? Well, this particular document is going to say that what are the countries where you have operations? Then if they say that we have operations in India, we have operations in USA, UK and South Africa, then it's going to say that, okay, if you have operations in USA, what is the amount of revenue that you're making in USA? What is the amount of tax that you're pay paying in USA? What are the number of employees that you have in a USA? What is the capital that you have in USA? Similarly, this document will also say that, you know, if you're operating in UK, what is the revenue that you're making in UK? What is the tax that you're paying in UK? What is the uh, number of employees that you have in UK? What are the accumulated earnings or the stated, uh, you know, what is the capital that you have in UK? Then it's going to say that if you're operating in South Africa, what is the, uh, you know, the revenue that you're making in South Africa? What is the tax, uh, profit before interest and tax that you're paying in South Africa, what are the number of employees that you have in South Africa, what are the capital, what is the capital that you have in South Africa. So now this particular document is going to say wherever you have operations, then it's going to tell you that, you know, what is the level that you're, you know, operations that you're doing there. Meaning to say that now if you say that, you know, this is the amount of tax that you're paying in USA, it's, it's it's telling them that, you know, if you have operations in USA, then this is the amount of tax. So there is a lot of exchange of information now that happens because of having something called a country by country report. So what I've done is I've summarized the three or three year documentation structure out here. So if you look at the local file and the master file, this has to be filed before the local tax authorities. So in our example, there is, you know, local file and then there is something called master file. Now, the local file, as I mentioned, is TP study and form 3 CEB. So now India will actually file a local file. So India with the Indian tax authorities, the Indian company will file form 3 CEB and uh, the TP study. The USA entity 
uh you know with the usa tax authorities will file their own form 3ceb and their own tp study the uk entity um uh, in their own uk jurisdiction will file their own form 3ceb and their tp study similar the south african entity in south africa will file form 3ceb their own kind of form 3ceb and their own tp study so that is basically called a local file for each entity and each entity will have to file this particular local file in their own uh, local jurisdiction with the local tax authorities so if you look at local file it's going to be a very very entity specific document you remember what i was talking about tp study it's a very very specific document you'll have to talk about all aes what are the transactions how have you substantiated those transactions so it's going to talk about all related party transactions and it's going to talk about a very very uh, in a detailed manner it's going to talk about all these um, you know economic analysis benchmarking analysis etc then there is something called master file master file is more like high level as i mentioned high level overview of the business what are the transfer pricing policies what are the r and d centers what are the value chain analysis it's going to talk about supply chain analysis that you know how a transaction goes from one entity to the other maybe the indian entity is manufacturing then the usa entity is going to distribute that product and you know the it services will be provided by the uk entity so you know the entire supply chain will be discussed in the master file but master file also has to be uh, filed with all the local tax authorities so indian entity will file master file in india us entity will file master file in usa um um uh, uk entity will file master file in uk south african entity will file their master file in south africa uh, there is requirement in india when you need to file master file etc i'm going to talk about that in detail and finally there is something called a country by country report now this is going to talk about jurisdiction wise information but there is only one cbcr for the entire group and this one cbcr is to be filed by the parent entity or it can be filed by alternate reporting entity a uh, r e uh, either it's the parent entity that can file it or the parent entity can also nominate someone to actually file it which is the alternate reporting entity uh, this is to be filed in the parent entity's jurisdiction so in our example the parent entity's jurisdiction is india and they need to file it uh, you know this particular document and this particular document is going to talk about all the jurisdiction in which this particular um, entity operates so for each jurisdiction it's going to talk about what is the revenue what is the profit before tax what are the taxes paid what are the taxes accrued what are the employees what is the stated capital what are the tangible assets in each particular jurisdiction so now if you actually look at these three documents together for the indian entity you know that you will get all the information for this indian entity where is this operating um, uh, you know what exactly are the revenue that it's making in this particular jurisdiction etc it's going to talk about all that particular information using the three tier documentation structure so if you look at you know the document documentation structure the three tier structure i understand that it's a very very elaborate but at least you know the problems of tax avoidance or the problems that you know what if one entity is not filing uh, you know uh, uh, information in this jurisdiction or you know what if there is a discrepancy between what is the indian entity reporting and what is the usa entity reporting that actually nullifies because of the requirement of cbcr so that is basically the concept of cbcr so the advantages if you look at the advantages of cbcr well um uh, you know there are consistent transfer pricing position so whatever the company is doing in usa whatever the company is doing in india or you know uk or south africa everything is going to become consistent and this is how the department can also make uh, you know audits and you know they can determine um, what are the transfer pricing risks etc so that way what is the major uh, you know advantage of a three tier documentation structure is to have a consistent transfer pricing uh, you know position as far as india is concerned uh, these requirements are provided in section 92d and section 286 now i'm going to come back to this particular document um, in a, a while this is a very very important this is a very very uh, you know good chart because it talks about all these forms uh, you know what exactly are the forms form 3c ad for cbcr etc form 3c eaa for master file 
form 3CEB for local file, etc. <clears throat> it's going to give you an information on all the forms, but we'll discuss all this in uh, you know, uh, detail. But before that, I want to talk about the threshold limit and then I'm going to come back to this particular slide. <laughs> I have a question here that if parent entity is located in Singapore and it holds 75% shareholding in their Indian subsidiary, then what all should they file in India? <laughs> Sorry. So if the parent entity in, is located in Singapore, uh, they need to file a local file and a master file in Singapore. In India also, they need to file a master file and a local file in India. In India, the local file will be called Form 3CEB and TP study. They'll have to file Form 3CEB and TP study in India. Beyond that, they will also have to file a CBCR. The Singapore entity will file the form. Uh, Singapore entity will file a CBCR in Singapore, and that is because the CBCR is uh, filed by the parent entity in the parent jurisdiction. In this situation, you said that the parent entity is located in Singapore, and hence they will be filing. They will be filing a CBCR in Singapore. <laughs> Sorry. Now, the point is that, um, you know, what is the threshold for CBCR in India? If they need to file CBCR in India, what is the threshold available for that? <laughs> now, Indian tax uh, laws basically say that you have to look at Section 286, Subsection 7 of the Income, in income Tax in India. And they basically say that, you know, if the consolidated financial of the group, if the consolidated group revenue, as in the Indian entity group revenue, USA entity group revenue, UK entity group revenue, and South African entity group revenue, if you combine that particular group revenue, and it's more than 6,400 uh, 6, crore rupees, then you need to file CBCR. Otherwise, CBCR is not required. <laughs> Sorry, guys. So the requirement to file CBCR is only if the consolidated group revenue in the consolidated financial statements is more than 6,400 crore rupees. And that's a very, very big threshold. Um, the next thing is that they have provided a time limit for furnishing of CBCR. Now, this is within 12 months from the end of the said reporting accounting year. And this is the form that is provided here. The question is that, um, uh, you know, as far as CBCR is basically concerned, it is filed if it if the threshold is more than 6,400 uh, crore rupees. And this is filed within a period of 12 months from the end of the reporting accounting year. Now, the thing is that there are a lot of definitions to what is, you know, a parent entity, <laughs> what is the alternate reporting entity, etc. What exactly are the meaning of these particular terms that is all provided in section 286 and it's also provided in the ICAI study manual. So I'd say go through that. What is the meaning of total consolidated group revenue? What is the meaning of accounting year? What is the meaning of international group? Although it's very, very logical, but the definition for all these terms are provided in, um, you know, section 286 itself. <laughs> Sorry. The next thing that is provided is the requirement for a master file in India. Now, as I mentioned, this is CBCR. This is clear. Then there is a local file, which is Form 3 CEB and, uh, uh, you know, a TP study that is also there. Now, there's something called master file also that has to be filed in India by an entity. Now, the for a master file, they basically say that there are two parts to it, part A and part B. <clears throat> part A is mandatory. But part B is to be filed only if the uh, consolidated group revenue is more than 500 crore rupees and the international transactions are more than 50 crore or intangible kind of transaction, intangible property transactions are more than 10 crore rupees. <coughs> So um, as far as master file is concerned, there are two parts to it. Part A, part A is mandatory for the master file and then there is part B. 
part b will be required only if the consolidated group revenue is more than 500 crores and the international transactions are more than 50 crore or the uh, intangible property transactions are more than 10 crore rupees only then the requirement of master file will be there if yes if master file is applicable then these are the forms wherein uh, the master file will be applicable so form 3c aa is the one for master file part a is applicable irrespective of the threshold and <clears throat> for part b the threshold is provided out here so these are the forms that will be required for cbcr and for master file in india and that's about it that we have uh, you know in documentation Uh, if the threshold, if the, there's a question on the chat box that if the parent company in India, but not crossing threshold limit, then who will file CBCR? Well, if the parent company is not crossing the threshold, if the consolidated group revenue is not more than 6,400 crore rupees, then obviously the requirement to file CBCR does not arise. They don't have to file CBCR then in that particular manner. Uh, let's uh, do one thing. Uh, Let's take a break out here and then I'm going to come back and talk about transfer pricing disputes in India. Let's take a break till 7.25 and we'll come back and talk about transfer pricing disputes. But before I talk about transfer pricing disputes at 7.25, I'm going to quickly revise through Form 3CEB because there is a uh, query on the group that Form 3CEB is not clear. So I'm going to revise Form 3CEB and then we'll discuss transfer pricing disputes at 7.25. If you have more questions, just put it on the chat box and I'll address them at 7.25 itself.
ओके गाइस लेट्स रिज्यूम सर एम आई ऑडिबल आर द स्लाइड्स विजिबल सर एम आई ऑडिबल Guys, can you confirm if I'm audible and the slides are visible? And then we can resume. <clears throat> can you please confirm if I'm audible and the slides are visible? Please, can you provide a confirmation if I'm audible? Um, and we'll resume. Can you guys hear me? okay so um this is where uh, you know we were talking about form 3c eb form 3c eb is more like a transfer pricing return so just like you know uh, when we have income in india we file an income tax return just when we have income similarly when we have transfer pricing applicability that is when there is um, you know an associated enterprise and there are international transactions with that particular uh, 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 with that particular associated enterprise then we have transfer pricing applicability and the moment we have applicability of tp we have to file a form 3c eb or like a transfer pricing return before the income tax authorities this is done in e filing manner it's done by the 31st of october of the assessment year so that's basically a form 3c eb the thing is that if you look at a form 3c eb it's divided into three parts that is part a wherein you provide the information relating to that particular associated enterprise then there's part b if there are international transactions then what kind of inter international transactions you know what is the description of the transaction what is the amount of those particular transactions and what is the method <clears throat> that you have used in respect of those particular international transaction that is what you need to establish and then there is part c to this form 3c ev wherein you have to provide the similar details for a specified domestic transaction so in essence a form 3c ev is more like a transfer pricing return um, that is there under the income tax act the next thing that we move to is something called a transfer pricing dispute uh, uh, situation in india now if you look at uh, you know transfer pricing disputes in india there was significant litigation india was such a high litigative uh, you know uh, place for transfer pricing disputes uh, there was a lot of litigation in india they <clears throat> there were simple topics initially like you know comparability what is the uh, choice of method etc but then we moved to complex uh, you know topics like marketing intangibles and you know financial transactions or something called location savings etc so a lot of disputes was there in india if you look at this particular chart uh you know you will see that there were so many disputes in 2013 14 14 15 uh, even 12 13 that particular year there were so many disputes in india and the disputes had only risen in that particular situation so first there were you know basic issues but now the issues are more they've moved towards more complex issues uh, you know in india as far as the you know issues in india are concerned um the you know there are um Uh, classic methods there are you know the traditional dispute resolution in india and then what we have are the uh, new techniques or you know the alternative dispute resolution mechanism so there are these two kinds the first the first one is you know the traditional dispute resolution in india when we talk about the traditional dispute resolution in india it's more like you know the uh, a case going to the assessing officer then it goes to the transfer pricing officer it goes to you know the commissioner of appeals then it goes to the income tax appellate tribunal itat then it goes to the high court and then it goes to the supreme court this is the you know the regular the classic the traditional dispute resolution mechanism that we have in india 
but at the same time for you know speedy uh, dispute resolution we also have an alternative dispute resolution in india or you know there are other techniques by which disputes should not even arise so those are provided as you know safe harbor rules and then there is something called apa but i thought first we'll discuss what is uh, the reference to a transfer pricing officer it's provided in section 92 ca of the income tax act and generally if you look at a, you know a particular dispute resolution a particular assessment the generally the case actually goes to an assessing officer also called as ao so under 92 ca which is you know a situation which is specific to uh, transfer pricing they basically say that ao if they feel that you know that the case basically involves an international transaction and the ao also feels that you know the alp of the transaction will have to be determined what the ao does is to actually refer that particular case to someone called a transfer pricing officer now transfer pricing officer is uh, you know at the level of joint commissioner or deputy commissioner or assistant commissioner of income tax and they are appointed as transfer pricing officers and they only deal with transfer pricing cases when it comes to determination of alp or you know similar cases relating to transfer pricing so the ao can actually refer the case to the transfer pricing officer but they'll have to take a prior approval of you know the pr principal commissioner of income tax or you know the commissioner of income tax but they can actually refer the case to the tpo when the tpo receives that particular case they will have to uh, you know tell the taxpayer that you know you need to produce more evidence to support the transfer pricing uh, as alp so if you have um, you know determined alp by a particular method the tpo can you know get in touch with the taxpayer and ask them to produce more information to substantiate that particular alp while you know going through that particular case if the tpo feels that you know there were other international transactions also then the tpo can determine alp of those other international transactions also for the same taxpayer then what the tpo does is actually uh, you know with all the information that they have received from the taxpayer more additional uh, you know information uh, additional information they will uh, um, determine the alp and they will intimate the assessing officer and the taxpayer both now this order of the tpo how they have determined the alp that will be binding on the ao now the ao uh, you know after considering what has been what has been received from the tpo they will uh, you know determine the alp and they will order they will pass a draft order so that is how a case goes uh, you know from the ao ao they may refer it to a tpo so ao will refer it to the tpo tpo will <clears throat> calculate the arms length price and then they will inform the ao and the assessee and obviously the ao will then pass a draft order and then the traditional route that we have uh, for litigation in india that actually continues in case of uh, transfer pricing also what is interesting is that um, you know apart from the traditional route which is um, you know after tpo it might just go to a cit appeals level and then it at uh, and then high court and supreme court we also have more uh, mechanisms in india uh, so that so as to make sure that tp disputes do not arise in india there was a time as i mentioned there were so many tp disputes in india and they had to come up with something so as to make sure there are no tp disputes you know that <clears throat> effort had to be made and so they came up with safe harbor rules now uh, safe harbor rules are provided in section 92 cb of uh, the income tax act and safe harbor rules are uh, you know very very interesting now what happened was just listen to the story that i have and then you know when we read through safe harbor rules it's going to become very very easy now you know there were these uh, typical transactions that were there in india more typical transaction in india were you know more like you know an indian entity sorry providing uh, it information technology or it support services to a usa entity so there was an indian entity and they were providing it services to a usa entity there was an indian entity which was providing software development services to a usa entity uh, or for that example there was an indian entity which was providing information technology enabled services to a uk entity 
then there were or more typical uh, typical you know transactions like the indian entity providing research and development services to a outside entity then the indian entity providing kpo services uh, knowledge process outsourcing to a uh, you know outside entity indian entity providing bpo services etc these were very very typical transactions it uh, information technology enabled services ites then you know um software development services research and development services kpos bpos etc and india being the hub of provision of those particular services they were providing it to the um, you know usa entity or uk entity or any other jurisdiction entity now what happened was for each of these services there was a lot of dispute whatever was the margin that was being earned by the indian entity it was all in dispute and because of this there was a lot of litigation in india so the income tax authorities they came up with something called a safe harbor rules and they listed down these typical transactions they said that listen if you they defined these circumstances they basically said that you if you as an indian entity is providing all these typical services to the usa entity or a uk entity or a germany entity or any entity for that matter then this is the transfer price that we will accept and so you will have to make sure that your transfer price is something this or more than this so they defined the transfer price they defined the circumstances that you know in these particular circumstances this is the transfer price that will be declared by you and accepted by us if the transfer price is you know um related to this particular level then we will accept it so what they basically try to do is define it in the income tax act that if this is the um, you know um, uh, amount that you have then it's going to be accepted by us and there will be no litigation so just as an example this is provided in uh, uh, you know the rules and uh, this is uh, rule 10c where they have said that if there is provision of software development services then it's going to be not less than 20% or not less than 22% if the aggregate is uh, less than 500 crore and more than 500 crore meaning to say that if the they are trying to say that if the indian entity is providing software development services to an entity outside india then we expect that the margin of the indian entity should not be less than 20 percent if it is less than 20 percent or more than 20 percent it's going to be accepted but if it is other than that then you know it's on to you whether you uh, you know you can actually put it as less than that but there might be litigation in future it depends then similarly for provision of information technology enabled services ites for that also they said 20 percent and 22 percent so they have listed down in these rules a lot of services kpo and you know research and development contract research and development information technology services etc and they have listed down a margin also that the indian entity should make this percent margin um, in respect of this particular uh, transaction so what they've done is under safe harbor rules they've defined the circumstances that if you fall under this particular circumstance that you're providing software development services then this is the margin that will be agreed between the taxpayer and the tax authorities this is the margin that will be agreed by the tax authorities and that is basically safe harbor rules meaning to say that you belong to a very very safe harbor you are at a harbor which is very very safe if you are at 20 percent then we can assure you that you are safe and there will be no litigation altogether the reason is that there was litigation because uh, all the indian entities were retaining maybe a margin of five percent seven percent and the tax authorities always questioned this margin of five percent seven percent obviously the indian tax authorities have margin of five percent or you know like a profit percentage of five percent then the tax that they are actually paying in india is also less and the tax authorities in india always questioned this five percent margin they said that no your margin should not be five percent it should be around 20 percent so you may pay more taxes in india so that is how there was a lot of litigation and now they've just defined the transfer price for uh you know some defined uh you know circumstances in india so that is what is you know meant by safe harbor that if you earning this particular margin which is provided in uh you know the law then you are at a safe harbor 
the question is that um, you know there are a lot of obviously benefits of safe harbors in india the first thing is there is advanced information so you know that you know if a particular entity is providing it ites services you know that you know they are going to earn 20% margin etc and then there is no litigation also so you know if someone is at a margin of 17% there will be litigation but then if someone is at a margin of 20% there will be not much litigation and then there will be ease in compliances there will be reduction in compliance cost there will be no l you know there will be no litigation there will be elimination of litigation costs etc now the thing is that uh, if you look at safe harbor rules they've defined all these uh, you know services for which you can uh, undertake safe harbor uh, 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 rules when you can you know undertake uh, benefits of these particular provisions so these are not restricted to all these services they go beyond also i'm just giving you an example that you know for software development services for information technology enabled services kpo contract research and development intra group loans uh, low value adding services even for sdts you can make use of safe harbors but only if uh, you are in the business of supply of electricity so you know if there are domestic companies in india on which domestic transfer pricing is applicable then for supply of electricity wheeling or electricity purchase of milk or milk products by cooperative societies from its members only for this you can make use of safe harbor and what is the percentage which is provided here um, you know just go through the law uh, look at the rule i have provided a link here for the um, you know rule that is the percentage that is considered as safe harbor that is the percentage that is considered as safe and there will be no litigation as long as you are belonging to that particular percentage and that is the concept of safe harbor in india Another thing that uh, you know the tax authorities in India have done is come up with something called advance pricing agreements (APAs), and this is quite a hit program uh, of uh, you know the income tax authorities. It is going very well. Uh, this is doing wonderfully well. The APA program uh, by the CBDT. I'm going to talk about what is the APA program, but before that, any questions here? Any questions on whatever we've done before this? Okay, great. So the next, uh, you know, uh, uh, program that has been uh, undertaken or, you know, the next uh, um, activity, the next uh, level that has been undertaken by the income tax authorities, by the CBDT, is to have something called uh, an advanced pricing uh, agreement, more like a, you know, a measure that has been taken by the CBDT. Now, the question is, what exactly is an APA? Well, APA is more like an agreement between a taxpayer and the tax authority, wherein they agree that if I undertake this particular transaction, then this is the transfer price or this is the margin that will be acceptable by you. So now what happened was we were talking about all these transactions. Let's say that uh, there is an Indian entity and this Indian entity is on a year on year basis purchasing some raw material from a USA entity. So we have an Indian entity related to a USA entity and this Indian entity is purchasing raw materials from the USA entity and it happens every year. Now the problem is that Indian entity has uh, you know, a profit margin of 5% but income tax authorities say that no, no, uh, you know, your margin should be at least 10% and so because of you know, the disagreement between the taxpayer and the tax authorities, there is litigation you know, going on and the problem is that because this transaction happens every year, there is that litigation every year. Now, what happens is to make sure that this litigation does not arise, um, the tax authorities and the taxpayer, they get together and they discuss on an agreement. What is this agreement? Well, the taxpayer says that, listen, this is, uh, you know, my transaction. I do this every year with my USA entity. I purchase raw material every year from my USA entity. These are 
the assumptions that I made. These are the economic conditions under which I operate. This is the transfer pricing methodology that I adopt. And this is the percentage, 5% that I earn. They tell it to the tax authorities. The tax authorities say that, listen, no, uh, we feel that the margin should be 10%. So what they do is they get together and they negotiate on one particular price. And that is basically considered as a transfer price for uh, uh, in case of an APA. So meaning to say that the taxpayer and the tax authorities, they get together and they agree, they get together on an agreement and they decide that, listen, if this is the transaction that I'm going to undertake, and it's going to happen year on year. These are the economic conditions and these are the terms and conditions under which I will undertake this transaction. This is the related party with which I'm undertaking this particular transaction. Then they agree on one figure and they decide that this is the figure at which will be declared as the arm's length price or this will be the figure that will be considered as uh, you know, an appropriate margin and the tax authorities will not question it and the taxpayers will also be happy with it and there will be no uh, litigation on this particular front going forward. So what they do is they um, decide in respect of a particular transaction, they decide that this is going to be the transfer price going forward. But this is subject to, you know, the transaction being the same because they've decided it for that particular transaction. So as long as the transaction is the same, the, uh, you know, the assumptions that are there in the transaction are the same. They decide on the determination of transfer pricing for that particular transaction. So it's more like, you know, the tax authorities and the taxpayer getting together on a one-on-one -on -one and deciding on uh, you know what is going to be the best transfer price on that particular transaction for which no further litigation will happen uh, you know in future so that is basically called advance pricing agreement and that is basically called an APA the pro the thing is that you know there are many benefits of APA. If you can um you know uh, the first one that is easily uh, predictable is the fact that there is um you know no litigation. There is going to be certainty. So you know the taxpayers know that they will be dealing at this particular per percentage, and the tax authorities know that you know they will be dealing at this particular percentage. There will be compliance burden. There will be long term savings because there will be no litigation. Um, you know, the compliance burden will also not be more, etc. Then this is available for, you know, because this is the best for complex transfer pricing issues. So, you know, you know that time will be saved and, um, you know, there will be no risk of audits, etc. over this term of the APA. So that is basically called an advance pricing agreement. APA is more like an agreement wherein the uh, tax authorities and the taxpayers are actually coming together and they decide that uh, if the taxpayer undertakes this particular transaction, then or if the taxpayer has undertaken this particular transaction, then this is the transfer price or this is the margin that will be acceptable by both the tax authorities and the taxpayers. So that is basically an APA. It's more like an agreement between the taxpayer and the tax authorities. I have a request here to take safe harbor again. I will uh, take up safe harbor after I discuss APA. But before that, any questions on APA? Okay. Any questions on um, what is APA? We'll be discussing, uh, you know, more details on what exactly is an APA going forward. But right now, any questions? Okay, so the point is, um, you know, how do APA really exist? What is the process for this entire APA? Well, the first thing is who's eligible to do this APA? Well, it is obviously, you know, some person, some taxpayer who has undertaken an international transaction. They will be taking up an APA. Now, the process is if you want to, if you as a taxpayer want to undertake or want to enter into an APA, then you will have to make an application in writing. When this application happens, there's something called a pre-consultation that happens. 
what is a pre consultation it's also called a pre filing consultation pre filing consultation means that you will be sitting with uh, you know the competent authority you will be discussing your case with the uh, you know competent authorities you will be discussing your uh, case with the ta uh, tax authorities and then you will discuss that you know this is my transaction this is uh, uh, the terms and conditions of my particular transaction. Now, what should be uh, the transfer price? So if you look at APA, it's more like a negotiation, which is going to happen. And based on this particular negotiation, the taxpayers and the tax authorities actually decide on a resolution to come up with a common transfer price at which transactions should happen, uh, you know, going forward. So if a taxpayer is interested in going for an APA, they have to, uh, they have to, file a form. It's called Form 3CED. This is application for APA. <coughs> and obviously, they have to give a particular fee for, uh, you know, APA. Now, the point is that what is this fee for APA? Well, if you're making an application for APA, the fee is that if your transaction is up to 100 crore, the fee is 10 lakh rupees. Uh, 100 to 200 crore, the fee is 15 lakh rupees. And if, um, you know, it is more than 200 crores, then it is 20 lakh rupees. Sorry, this is more than 200 crore. Uh, the fee is 20 lakh rupees uh, in terms of in terms of APA. So it's a very, very expensive process. But at least you know, I'm going to talk about what is this rollback in a while. But at least you know that, uh, you know, if, uh, uh, you know, you're actually filing a fee, if you're giving a fee of 10 lakh, 15 lakh or 20 lakh, at least going forward, there will be no litigation. So you'll be saving on litigation cost, but you'll have to give this particular cost, uh, you know, to the department that is. The question is that, um, you know, when can you actually file an APA? This is an important, uh, you know, topic on when can the APA be filed? Well, I'll uh, we'll do an example also on this. But it basically says that if you're talking about a previous year, before the first day of the previous year, if, you know, the transactions are of continuing nature, or you can actually take an APA for future transactions also. So if you decide that, you know, going forward, I will be undertaking a transaction, then also you can sit with the tax authorities to determine in advance that what should be the transfer price at which you will be taking the transaction. So before undertaking those transactions, you can file an AP application or before the first day of the previous year, if your transactions are running, then also you can file an APA application. Uh, the APA, uh, you know, if you file an APA, and whatever the tax authorities and the taxpayer discuss as the percentage that will be binding on the tax uh, taxpayers and it will also be binding on the tax authorities. So it will be binding on the principal commissioner of income tax and the commissioner of income tax. If there is change in law, then it can be changed. Or if there is, you know, change in the transaction, then it's not going to be binding. But as long as the transactions remain the same, it's going to be binding on the taxpayers and the tax authorities. And if you understand now, if you see the APA is always based on some assumptions or, you know, some uh, negotiation. So it requires a lot of, uh, um, you know, uh, verification before the application is actually filed. Now, if you, um, you know, look at a particular, uh, you know, APA, an APA is generally there for a period of five years. So, you know, if you make an application today, you can make an application for one year, two year, three year, four year, or maximum five years. So if you make an app APA application, it's going to be for a period of maximum five years, and then you can renew the APA for the next period of five years. So that basically means that if I am undertaking a transaction is in 2020, 23, I can take an APA for 2023, 24, 25, 26, 27. So going forward five years, I can take it. Now, the best part is that the Indian income tax authorities, they basically say that you can also take an APA for before four years. So before 2023, I can go back four years and I can take an APA for those also. So if I may, if my case is in litigation and I'm very, um, you know, stressed with that particular lit litigation, which is happening for my company um, for, you know, the four years prior to today, then what I can do is I can take a APA for those four years also and the litigation will be dissolved and, uh, you know, the APA will basically be there in existence. So if you actually see the APA validity in India, the APA is for five years hence and four years backward. So if you 
look at the total period, the APA is for four years and then for five years. So APA can be taken for nine years at one point in time. And the four years prior, that is basically called a rollback provision. So APA can be taken for five years going forward. So there will be certainty and you can get into an agreement with the tax authorities that going forward, uh, uh, you know, I have clarity on what is going to be the transfer pricing percentage, the margin for going forward five years. But you can also have this clarity for four years prior, which is basically called the rollback provision. So APA is there for nine years straight up. And the fee for rollback is 5 lakh rupees. So that is really the concept of an APA. I have questions out here that I'm going to address now. The first question is the to repeat safe harbor. I will repeat safe harbor in a while. Let me finish this particular uh, you know concept on APA. The second thing is, can PC, P, PCCIT be competent authority? Um, uh, generally, they have competent authorities for, uh, you know, uh, APAs. Uh, no, they cannot be, uh, you know, competent authorities. Actually, whatever is the competent authority, I can't, you know, really say right here. I don't want to say a no also, but... Uh, as far as, uh, you know, these particular things, if you're looking at this uh, situation, yes, in this situation, it is binding on them. But uh, competent authorities uh, for APA are actually very different. Uh, APA agreement valid for how many years? As I mentioned, APA agreement is valid for five years going forward and even four years backward also it is applicable. Uh, so APA can be applicable for nine years and then for five years and then you can take renew it again for five years. So it just depends. You know, there are people who take APA for two years. There are people who take APA for three years. Maximum, you can take it for five years, not beyond that. And then you can take it for previous four years also. How to apply for APA? Well, as I mentioned, the form is available out here. I have provided the form here. It is provided in Rule 10I. Uh, it is provided in form 3CED. It's an application for APA. You have to deposit this requisite fee, which is, you know, 5 lakh, 10 lakh, which I just mentioned. And uh, the moment you apply for APA, there will be a pre-filing consultation, which is more like, you know, discussing the details of your transaction. The difference between APA and rollback, are they interlinked? Well, uh, APA is a wider term. And within APA, uh, to understand what is the validity of the APA, well, the validity of APA is five years and then there is a rollback provision. So rollback provision is more like a, a, a component of APA that meaning to say that APA can be rolled back. When I say APA can be rolled back, that means you can get clarity on back four years also. So APA validity has a rollback provision. Um, value of international transaction means book value. Yes, uh, value of international transaction means, uh, yes, this particular value means book value. Before first day of the previous year, give an example. Um, I have, there are, uh, you know, queries on the group and they've asked for an example of this. I have an example of this in this particular slide, but just allow me two minutes. I'm going to cover two more, uh, you know, situations of APA. Then I'm going to go to this particular example. Now, the thing is that, um, you know, let's decide that I have entered into an APA with my, uh, you know, associated uh, with my, you know, with the tax authorities. And, you know, because there was a lot of litigation to my transaction, I entered into an APA. And let's say I entered into an APA for five years. Now, the question is that can this APA be revised or not? Well, sorry, the, the thing is that this APA can be revised, uh, you know, by either of the parties or on the request, you know, the tax authorities can revise it or the taxpayer can also make a request to actually revise it if there is change in critical assumptions. When I say change in critical assumptions, uh, let's take an example that I am supplying uh, you know, I'm purchasing from my USA entity, 
uh, in our example, I was purchasing from my USA entity. And, uh, you know, when I was applying for an APA, I had to give what are the terms and conditions of my transaction. So I said that, you know, I'm purchasing from my USA entity and they give me a credit period of one month. And so, uh, you know, the taxpayers decided that, yes, if you enter into an APA, the, your margin will be 10%. And that is where we close the APA. Now, going forward, there could be a change in critical assumption. Uh, this change in critical assumption could be that going forward, my tax, my USA entity says that, listen, I'm not going to give you a credit period of one month. Now I'm going to give you just a credit period of 10 days. So that basically means that this change in credit period will have an effect on the margin that was decided with the tax authorities. And now I will go back to the tax authorities and I will tell them that, listen, the terms and conditions of the transaction has changed. Now the transfer price shouldn't be 10%. It should be something else. So if there is a change in critical assumption or if there is a change in law or if there is a request from the competent authority, in these particular instances, the APA percentage that you decide on or whatever you decided in terms of the APA, it can actually be revised. But before you do that, you have to give an opportunity of being heard uh, you know, to the assessee. And even if you revise it, the first APA will say that it was valid till this date and now there is a new APA in place. It has been revised. So the new APA will have the date from which it is applicable. So they're very, very specific. If there is a change in critical assumption, they can revise it, but then they will, the old APA will have a date and the new APA will have a new date in uh, there. So that is what, uh, you know, is given in uh, revision of APA. Now, there is rule 10R, which says that the APA can be cancelled also. Well, if, you know, there are these terms and conditions in the, in the APA and there was failure to comply by those particular terms and conditions, or if you do not give the compliance uh, report or, you know, there are errors or, um, um, you know, there is some failure on part of the assessee. So, meaning to say that you have to comply with those particular terms and conditions of the APA in a very strict manner. If you do not do that, or if there is, you know, uh, some fraud or misrepresentation, then there is cancellation or, of APA also that could actually happen. Now, I was talking about, you know, the um, APA application. When can you make this application for APA? Well, I said that, you know, if you're uh, transaction is one which is running on a day-to-day -day basis, then you have to make sure that before the first day of the previous year, you have to apply for APA. Otherwise, if your transaction is something that you propose to apply in the future, then before undertaking that particular transaction, you have to make an application for APA. Now, the question is, what is this before the first day of the previous year? For this particular situation, let's take an example here. Please take some time to, please take a minute to read through this particular uh, you know, question. The question is in blue, the answer is in black. Please take a minute to read through this particular question and then we'll discuss it. Okay, so let's take this example again. Um, there is someone called XYZ Private Limited. Now, this XYZ Private Limited is supplying to its AE in a foreign company. They have applied for APA in respect of this transaction with its AE. Uh, with its AE. 
the application for APA was filed on 15th March 2023 and APA was signed on 2nd June 2023. Discuss from which previous year APA would be applicable. The thing is, when the APA was signed, we don't have to consider that date. We just consider the date when the APA application was made. Now, the previous year actually ends on the 31st of March. But before the previous year could end, we actually filed our application, which was 15th March 2023. So if we are filing in the year, uh, you know, uh, 15th March 2023, which is the year 2223, we are filing in that particular year, then APA would be applicable from 2324. But the thing is, if we had delayed it a bit, if we were filing it, say, for example, on 1st April 2023, then it would have been 24 to 25. But because we filed this, um, uh, you know, before the financial year ending, we, because we filed it on the 15th of March 2023, that means our APA will be applicable from previous year 23-24. So 1st April 2023, to 31st of March 2024, it will be applicable for that particular year. So this is, uh, you know, what it basically says in respect of uh, the uh, APA application. Uh, there is a question in the group, what about four years backward? Four years backward basically means that in this, let's take this particular example. It basically means that APA will be applicable for uh, previous year 23-24. And then if they had applied for five years, that means the first year was 23-24, 24-25, 25-26, 26-27, 27-28. So that basically means that they have got certainty in transfer pricing, uh, uh, you know, margin till 2028, you know, starting from 2023-24. 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, uh, 27, 28, uh, etc. So for five years, they have got clarity. Now, if they had applied for rollback also, they would have gotten clarity for four years before this also. So 22, 23, 21, 22, 20, 21, 19, 20. They could have gotten clarity for four years before also uh, if they had applied for rollback. But it just depends on what is the kind of APA application that you're actually making in that particular uh, situation. Uh, the next topic that we have is something called secondary adjustment. Again, a very, very interesting topic. Uh, uh, you know, there are uh, there is uh, one uh, question here, one request here to take safe harbor rules again. I'm going to take that towards the end of the you know lecture today. Uh, whatever doubts that you have, you can put it there because this is the last lecture on transfer pricing. Uh, we can extend the class by a few, uh, you know, minutes and I can take all the doubts there. So I'm going to talk about safe harbor rules uh, as we finish this particular lecture today. Uh, if you have any other question, uh, please let me know. Otherwise, we start with a new topic, which is basically called secondary adjustment. Now, the secondary adjustment is a very, very interesting topic. Let's say that, you know, there is, um, you know, transfer pricing and there was uh, transfer pricing applicability and these two related parties were transacting at a price and this was not at arm's length price. So obviously what the tax authorities will do is come up with a transfer pricing adjustment. So if two entities are transacting at, you know, a price which is not at arm's length price, obviously the tax authorities will come into play and the tax authorities will say that, uh, you know, the transfer price, uh, the ALP should have been this. And what the uh, tax authorities will do is to impose something called a transfer pricing adjustment. Now, this transfer pricing adjustment is also called primary adjustment. So it's as simple as that. Primary adjustment means the general transfer pricing adjustment that is imposed by the tax authorities if the assessees are not uh, transacting at a price which is basically called the arm's length price. So the regular adjustment that is there is called the primary adjustment. Now the question is what exactly is secondary adjustment? 
So secondary adjustment basically means it was introduced, um, you know, in India by the Finance Act 2017. Now, secondary adjustment basically means that, you know, because there was primary adjustment. So, you know, if my, um, uh, if in India, uh, the related parties were transacting at 80 rupees, just giving you an example, the related parties in India were transacting at 80 rupees. Uh, the tax authority said that no, 80 rupees is not the price. Uh, the ALP or the arm's length price should have been 120 rupees. So what the tax authorities will do, they will add back 40 rupees. Now this adding back of 40 rupees is something called primary adjustment. So the tax authorities have initiated a transfer pricing adjustment of 40 rupees so as to make uh, this at ALP. Now what is secondary adjustment? Secondary adjustment basically means that, um, you know, there is something called excess money and this Secondary adjustment makes sure that this excess money of 40 rupees, it should be made available to the tax authority, uh, to the associated enterprises in India. It should be repatriated to, uh, uh, you know, in India. And that 40 rupees is basically called secondary adjustment that taxpayers will have to do in their uh, books of accounts. So, what they're really trying to say is that this is 40 rupees of primary adjustment and, you know, tax authorities will impose this transfer pricing adjustment. But now you'll have to make sure that this 40 rupees actually comes back to India. And that is basically that adjustment in the tax, in the cash profit of the taxpayer. So as to make sure that it is in line with primary adjustment, that is basically called secondary adjustment. So again, primary adjustment was 40 rupees. Now, if you need to make sure that this 40 rupees actually is repatriated and it is coming back to India and it is added to the, uh, you know, profits of the Indian enterprise, there is obviously an adjustment in the cash profits of this Indian taxpayer. And this repatriation to India of 40 rupees is basically called secondary adjustment. So there are two adjustments. A primary adjustment is the basic one, basic transfer pricing adjustment. And this excess money, um, if it is repatriated to India by the USA associated enterprise or by any other associated enterprise, that repatriation and you know adjusting it to the cash profits of the taxpayer in India, that is basically called secondary adjustment. So secondary adjustment is more like an adjustment in the books of accounts of the assessee in India. Uh, to reflect that the actual allocation of profits is consistent with the transfer price as determined by primary adjustment. So you are basically removing the imbalance between cash account and actual profit of the assessee. So the thing about secondary adjustment is basically if you make sure that the associated enterprise now gives 40 rupees to the uh, you know Indian tax authorities it is repatriated it is provided in um, uh, you know the cash account of the Indian enterprise and added in the cash account of the Indian enterprise that is basically called secondary adjustment so that repatriation to India is basically called secondary adjustment which basically is more like an adjustment in the books of accounts of the Indian tax authorities and why does that happen because now by secondary adjustment, uh, you know, the 40 rupees will be added to the books of accounts of the Indian enterprise. And now the Indian enterprise will have to pay tax on the 40 rupees that is added in their accounts also. So that repatriation, in other words, is basically called secondary adjustment. So take one minute to actually go through this particular slide and then I'm going to um, address this issue using uh, the chart which is provided in the next slide. So this is what is secondary adjustment. Take one minute to read through this.
uh, there is a question on the group. What happens if the difference is recalculated or is paid without repatriation? Um, I'm going to talk about that. But, you know, this uh, concept of without repatriation cannot really arise in that particular sense. So if the, if the uh, you know, profits in India is 80 rupees, um, and the transfer pricing authorities actually say that no, uh, you know, the ALP is 120 rupees um, and, you know, you should be actually paying tax on 120 rupees. What is the point if, uh, you know, how will they actually pay it if the 40 rupees difference does not even come to India? What is the point of having all this, uh, you know, discussion? They basically say that what is being retained by the Indian tax authorities should actually be sorry, what is to be retained by the Indian taxpayer should actually be 120 rupees. The revenue in India should be 120 rupees. What is the point of having all these transfer pricing adjustments and all these things if this amount is not even coming back to India? So that is the situation. That is the reasoning behind secondary adjustment just to make sure that this repatriation happens uh, you know, to India. But there are also instances where the repatriation does not happen. And you know, what if the associated enterprise does not repatriate it, etc. I'm going to talk about that also. So what happens is, um, you know, there is a time limit out there. So Indian tax authorities, so there is a time limit out there also. So, um, you know, the Indian tax authorities basically say that this uh, repatriation should happen actually by, uh, you know, within 90 days. And they have provided a detailed table out here on, you know, 90 days from which date, etc. I'm going to display that. But they basically say that this repatriation should happen to India, uh, you know, in 90 days. And what if the repatriation does not happen? Well, if the repatriation does not happen, then we as Indian tax authorities, we'll just presume that, you know, the Indian taxpayer has given a loan, more like a deemed loan to the associated enterprise. So if they do not give us 40 rupees, then we'll just presume that the Indian taxpayer has given a loan of 40 rupees, uh, you know, to the associated enterprise. And there will be a notional interest that the Indian taxpayer will actually earn by giving this loan. And so we will tax the Indian taxpayer on that notional interest also. So meaning to say, you know, talking about this again, I think this much is clear that there should be a repatriation, okay? Indian tax uh, payer should get 40 rupees. But the point is, what if the Indian taxpayer does not get this 40 rupees in uh, 90 days? Well, then Indian tax authorities say that, listen, we'll just presume that, you know, the Indian taxpayer has given a loan of 40 rupees uh, you know, to the associated enterprise because rightfully this 40 rupees belongs to the Indian taxpayer. If they do not, are if they are not repatriated within 90 days, then we'll just presume that they have given a loan, uh, you know, more like a deemed loan that they have given to the associated enterprise. And what happens if Indian enterprise gives a loan to the associated enterprise? Obviously, they'll earn something called a notional interest. So they said that then we'll presume, second step we'll presume that the Indian enterprise is getting a interest from the associated enterprise on that loan of 40 rupees. And obviously, if they are getting an interest income, Indian taxpayer will have to pay an, um, a tax uh, to the Indian tax authorities on that interest that they're earning from this particular loan. So there are, you know, it's all connected that way. So if you look at this particular chart, uh, you know, right here, it basically says that there is an Indian company and uh, this Indian company gets into a transaction with a non-resident. Now, this transaction was not at ALP. It was resulting in uh, increase in the total income or, you know, like a decrease in loss. Basically, it was not um, at uh, uh, arm's length price. So, because this was not at arm's length price, then uh, the Indian Income Tax Authorities, they did something called a primary adjustment. What was the primary adjustment? Well, it was ALP minus the transaction price. But you will have to make sure that secondary adjustment cases arise only if the primary adjustment is more than 1 crore. So in our example, obviously, it was 40 rupees. Uh, just kidding. Uh, you know, 40 rupees. Let's make it 40 crore rupees. So if in our example, the Indian enterprise transacted with the non-resident at, uh, you know, say, for example, uh, 80 crore rupees. And uh, this is where Indian tax authorities said that no, the ALP would have been 120 crore rupees. So obviously there will be a primary adjustment of 120 crore, which is the ALP minus the transaction price, which is 80 crore. So 120 minus 80 makes it 
40 crore and because this is more than 1 crore primary adjustment will be there and because this is more than 1 crore secondary adjustment will also be there now the point is that this 40 crore rupees should come back to india or it should be remitted to india within 90 days what happens if it does not come to india well we'll just presume that you know the indian enterprise has given a loan to the associated enterprise and this is more like a deemed loan what happens if there is a deemed loan? Well, there will be an interest on this deemed loan and the Indian enterprise is earning an interest. What happens if the Indian enterprise is earning an interest? Well, they'll have to pay tax on this interest income in India. So that is the whole concept of uh, secondary adjustment. Now, the question is, what is the interest? What is the time limit, etc.? Well, that is provided in, uh, you know, these particular slides out here. So this is uh, what I just mentioned, that this is the entire, uh, uh, you know, concept that non-repatriation is more like a deemed loan or this is considered as an advance. You can read through this particular slide when you're revising. But the question is, what is the time limit? Well, it is 90 days, 90 days from the due date of filing of return from the said order from the due date of filing of return. It's just written out here. Uh, you know, if this is a situation of APA, then uh, 90 days from the end of the APA, end of the month in which APA was filed, etc. So generally, the repatriation should happen within 90 days. This is a slide, uh, uh, you know, it says that secondary adjustment will be applicable only if there is a primary adjustment, obviously. I mean, you, you can get secondary adjustment only if there is a primary adjustment. Going back to the table, this is a slide which basically says that only if there is primary adjustment, will there be a secondary adjustment. If there is no repatriation, where is secondary adjustment even coming from? So if there is no difference, if there is no excess money, this is called excess money, this ALP minus transaction price. In our example, 40 crores is basically called uh, excess money. So if there is no excess money, obviously, what will you repatriate? So secondary adjustment will arise only if there is a primary adjustment. And the law is worded in a manner that they want primary adjustment more than 1 crore rupees so as to have secondary adjustment take place. Now, the question is, they should be repatriated within 90 days. And the next question is, what is the interest that will be uh, there on deemed loan? Well, if this uh, repatriation does not happen within 90 days, then this will be considered as a deemed loan. If this is considered as a deemed loan, there will be an interest imputation. What is the amount of interest? Well, it will be one year marginal cost of fund plus three 25 basis point and uh, if this international transaction is in foreign currency then LIBOR six months plus 300 basis point so that is uh, you know the calculation that we'll have to do but this is the entire this if you look at this particular chart it's really interesting this is the entire concept of uh, you know secondary adjustment you can take a minute look at this particular chart if there are any questions, please post it on a, on the chat box. Otherwise, we'll discuss a question on secondary adjustment and it might just get further clear. I have some queries here that I want to answer. Uh, <clears throat> so what happens is, um, you know, there is a difference between uh, um, tax adjustment, like an adjustment, and then getting that money, uh, uh, you know, back. So primary adjustment is more like an adjustment. And then secondary adjustment is more like, you know, uh, changing the books of accounts. So that is basically the difference between primary and secondary adjustment.
um if it is treated as a deemed loan um i'm going to talk about you know the loan uh, uh, the percentage etc but there is an interest cost also <coughs> so this is uh, just to make sure this entire concept of treating it as a deemed loan uh, the entire concept is uh, treating it as a deemed loan. It basically arises uh, uh, so as to uh, initiate this particular transaction, so as to force the repatriation to happen. This is the reason that they've come up with, uh, you know, deemed loan. The if you look at the OECD transfer pricing, uh, you know, guidelines, they basically say that you can, you know, secondary adjustment can take any of the forms. It can be a constructive dividend. It can be an equity contribution. You know, this uh, entity has given an equity contribution to the other entity. In India, we consider it as a deemed loan. So it's on to the different uh, jurisdictions on what they want to treat it as. Uh, the LIBOR rates uh, till the amount, till the time that it is not repatriated, it is going to be payable. So it's basically, uh, uh, you know, this particular amount is basically dependent on when will repatriation uh, happens. The, if the repatriation happens late, then the amount will obviously be a big amount. The point is that, um, uh, you know, what if the excess money is not repatriated? Well, in case the excess money, um, in case the associated enterprise decides that this excess money, we are not repatriating it within the time limit, which is 90 days. Well, then the assessee can uh, pay an additional tax on that particular amount. And that is, remember that this is an additional tax. So they'll have to pay a tax at the rate of 18% plus surcharge plus 4% cess. And this will be 20.9664%. Uh, if they pay an additional tax on those 40 crore rupees, they'll have to pay an additional tax. If they decide to pay an additional tax and they do not want this repatriation to happen, then they'll have to, you know, you don't have to make secondary adjustment mm -hmm. and the interest uh, uh, will also not be required. Uh, but then uh, this particular additional tax that they actually pay, which will be considered as final payment of tax and no deduction will be allowed for this particular um, additional tax payment, which has been paid. Now, the thing is, so as to make it more clear, um, uh, you know, the in, so as to make it more um, enticing, the income tax authorities have said that it does not matter. You can get this excess money from any of the uh, associated enterprise. So if the transaction is between India and USA, you don't have to wait for the in USA enterprise to repatriate it. As long as the Indian enterprise is getting some money from any associated enterprise, it will actually be considered. So 40 crore rupees from any of the associated enterprise um, is fine as long as India is getting back its share of uh, you know profits let's discuss an example here on uh, uh, you know what is considered as secondary adjustment please take a minute to read through, through this example it's very very interesting example because this example has uh, you know flavors of uh, lecture one lecture two and lecture three today so we're going to be talking about what are associated enterprises more like recapitulating it uh, method and then finally applying something called a secondary adjustment out here please read through this particular example and then we'll discuss it Okay, let's take this example here. So, um, let's, uh, there are some questions on the group again. Uh, you know, please allow me some time. Please allow me some time to actually take you through this example 
and then we can you know discuss these particular uh, you know questions that we have on the group please allow me some time <clears throat> So this question talks about um, on 1st April 2023, this PQR Limited, it's basically an Indian company. And this Indian company um, advanced a loan of 6 crore rupees to XYZ Inc. This is a company from Singapore. So there's an Indian company and this Indian company gives a loan of 6 crore rupees to uh, uh, you know a Singapore entity. As on the date of loan, the book value in the books of accounts of XYZ Inc. was 10 crore. And XYZ Inc. paid the entire loan along with interest on 31st August 2023. If you look at this particular leg of the question, the first leg says, would PQR Limited and XYZ Inc. be treated as associate enterprises for the purposes of transfer pricing adopted by the assessing officer? Is If yes, why? Do you think that this will be treated as an associated enterprise? PQR gives a loan of 6 crore to xyz and xyz has a book value of uh you know 10 crore rupees do you think that this will be treated as an associated enterprise pqr and xyz please if you if you feel yes put it on the chat box uh if you feel no uh put it on the chat box also provide the threshold which is there in uh section 92a on whether they will be treated as associated enterprise or not Do you think these will be considered as associated AEs? Yes, exactly. Yes, these will be considered as associated enterprise because if you look at section 92A subsection 2, it says that if one entity gives a loan of more than 51% or more than 51% of the book value of the other enterprise, then two enterprises are related to each other. So in this particular situation, the book value of the asset is 10 crore and the loan given is more than 51%. It's more than 5.1. It is 6 crore. Hence, PQR and XYZ are related to each other. So this is what I've provided in the first uh, you know, situation also. Now, the question says that during the financial year 23-24, PQR Limited also entered into an agreement uh, with XYZ in to provide 20,000 medical equipment at a cost of 7,400 per unit. Meaning to say that they have a financial transaction and uh, they are giving medical equipments and 20,000 medical equipments, they have given it at a cost of 7,400 per unit. So these are associated enterprises. They are transacting at 74 per unit. 7,400 uh, rupees per unit. The assessing officer, treats, assessing officer treats them as associated enterprise and wants to recompute the income of PQR at arm's length. Now, uh, it says calculate the arm's length price of PQR Limited, which sells the same equipment at 9,000 per unit to Y and 95 to X Limited. Both of them are unrelated parties. PQR is not a wholesale dealer. Can you tell me the method that you will use? So, <clears throat> related party transaction is at 7,400 per unit. And then they have two comparables out here, two unrelated party to one, they are supplying at 9,000 and to the other one, they are supplying at 9,500. Can you think of a method here? Which method we should apply as the most appropriate method, MEM? Which method? Exactly. We should use CUP method. We are using CUP method here and that is because... Um, that is because there are comparables already available to us. Independent companies who are supplying the same thing. And this is a situation of internal comparable being available. So we have two comparables available here. And if you remember, uh, uh, you know, if there are two comparable companies, then we use the concept of arithmetic mean. So what we'll do is we'll use 9000 and 9500 and we'll calculate the arithmetic mean of these two so 9000 plus 9500 divided by 2 so this is 9250 9000 plus 9500 divided by 2 which is 9250 now 9250 is the arm's length price and we have transacted at 7400 that means that we have transacted at less, whereas arm's length price was 9250. 
So there will be a transfer pricing adjustment out here. What will be the transfer pricing adjustment? Well, the difference, which is 9250, which is the arm's length price, minus 7400 at which we have transacted. So 1850, 1850 multiplied by the number of units, which is 20,000. So the transfer pricing adjustment is going to be 3.7 crores, 20,000 into 1850. This is also called as primary adjustment. That basically means that there will be a primary adjustment and this 1850 is also considered as excess amount. This is called primary adjustment. Now, we will have to make sure. Now, the question says, what are the options available to PQR in respect of such increase in transfer price by income tax authorities if PQR limited accepts such transfer price? So, there is a transfer pricing adjustment like a primary adjustment of 3.7 crore rupees. Now, what happens is, what happens if there is a secondary adjustment? Well, there will be secondary adjustment because there is a primary adjustment. So they'll have to make sure that, uh, you know, this 3.5 crore rupees is repatriated to India. Well, it is to be repatriated within 90 days. And what happens if this repatriation does not happen? Well, then if they don't want to repatriate within 90 days, well, then they'll have to pay an additional income tax. What is the additional income tax? Well, the additional income tax will be 20.964%, which is 18% uh, tax, 12% surcharge, and 4% cess, which will come to uh, 77,57,568 rupees. So if you don't want to repatriate this amount, then you have to pay a tax, an additional income tax of this and no deduction under the Income Tax Act will be allowed for this particular amount. So it just depends. Um, also, if they do not, uh, you know, repatriate within 90 days and they are not even opting to offer an additional income tax, then we'll just presume that, uh, you know, 3.7 crore is more like a deemed loan which has been given by uh, the Indian entity to the, uh, you know, Singapore entity and they'll have to impute interest and calculate that interest, add that interest amount uh, in the books of accounts of the Indian entity and the Indian entity will have to offer that amount to tax in India. So that's how secondary adjustment really, uh, you know, goes. Please let me know if there are doubts in this particular question. Also, there was a threshold which I forgot to mention. The primary adjustment was more than 1 crore rupees and hence secondary adjustment came into play. The primary adjustment was 3.7 3 crore rupees and hence they got uh, secondary adjustment into play. The last second topic that we have, uh, you know, for today is limitation of interest deduction, again, which is very, very, um, you know, logical and informative and interesting. It's section 94B of the Indian Income Tax Act. But before that, any questions? Okay, now the next topic that we have is limitation of interest deduction. Uh, I'm going to give you a base on, you know, what is limitation on uh, of interest deduction. Well, let's say that, um, you know, a company wants to, uh, 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 you know, finance uh, its capital. Now, the company has two options. The company can either uh, raise equity or, uh, you know, debt and equity are basically the two instruments that uh, the company has. So the company wants to uh, finance it. The company wants to capitalize it. Obviously, it has two options. Either it can uh, raise debt or it could be an equity option that the company, uh, you know, has. Now, if you look at a multinational enterprise, they generally go in with the concept of debt rather than equity. They prefer debt over, uh, you know, equity. Um, uh, before I actually go to this particular topic, I have, uh, you know, questions in the chat box. 
um, there are two questions and then there is one topic on safe harbor rules. I remember it. Uh, I'm going to discuss it at nine o'clock after I finish with, you know, the entire lecture. I don't want to, you know, uh, sort of block, uh, you know, what I'm doing right now. So I will answer those two questions and I will answer safe harbor, uh, you know, again, please allow me some time. I'll do that towards the end of the lecture. So now we're talking, talking about interest on uh, interest of uh, limitation on interest deduction. So now if we talk about, um, uh, you know, a company, it has two options. Either it can get equity or it can get something called a debt. Uh, MNCs, if you look at, they prefer the option of debt more because uh, there is an interest that is associated with debt. So if I obviously, you know, if I take a loan, if I take a debt, then obviously I have to pay an interest onto it. The moment I pay an interest onto it, I know that there will be an interest deduction that will be available to me. So if I, as an Indian enterprise, pay an amount of interest, uh, you know, if I take a loan from my associated enterprise, if I take debt from my associated enterprise, I obviously will have to pay an interest to my associated enterprise. The moment I pay an interest to my associated enterprise, I can claim it as a deduction and pay tax on lesser amount of profit. So if you look at MNCs, they always prefer debt over equity because uh, uh, they can get into intra-group financing because they can claim that particular deduction on interest. So what they can do is in the high tax jurisdiction, they can claim an interest deduction and in the low tax jurisdiction, uh, you know, they can pay all the all the taxes out there. So they can shift their profits from a high tax jurisdiction to a low tax jurisdiction by means of something called an interest deduction. And this is where uh, section 94B has come up with a limitation on interest deduction. So 94B basically says that, uh, listen, if you have uh, taken a loan from your multinational enterprise, if you have taken a loan from your associated enterprise and you need to pay them an interest, well, the amount of interest that you can claim under PGBP is going to be limited. And what will be it limited to? Well, it's going to be uh, the amount of deduction that you can claim. It's going to be limited to the total interest payable in excess of 30% of earnings before interest tax, depreciation and amortization or the interest paid or payable, whichever is less. This is very confusing right now that, you know, what will be the amount of deduction available? I'm going to discuss a question out here, which will say, what will be the, uh, you know, amount of interest available? I'm going to talk about that. But just understand the concept right now that if there is an Indian entity, and this Indian entity has taken a loan from its associated enterprise, obviously the Indian entity will have to pay an interest to the associated enterprise. Now, what the Indian enterprise does is, it obviously the amount of interest that is given to its associated enterprise, it's going to take a deduction in its book of account. In the uh, Under the head PGBP, it will take an interest deduction. Now, the question is that section 94B says that your interest deduction, it's going to be limited to a particular amount. What is that particular amount? It's going to be limited to this amount or it's going to be limited to the interest that you've actually paid, whichever is less. So interest that you pay in excess of 30% of uh, EBITDA or interest paid or payable, whichever is less. That will be the interest limitation. We'll discuss an example and then it will uh, you know, get more clear. So this is what I've, you know, provided in terms of a chart out here. And after this chart, we'll discuss an example on what is the interest limitation. But let's look at this chart first. Now, this chart says that is the borrower an Indian company or a PE of a foreign company? So what is essential is that... Uh, you know, because this is an Indian section, obviously it's provided in the Indian Income Tax Act, it is uh, available for an Indian company. Or maybe there is a foreign company and this foreign company has a permanent establishment in India. Then also this will be applicable. But primarily what you need is an Indian company. When you say yes, well, then you'll have to say, is the borrower a bank or insurance company or notified NBFC? 
well if you say yes then uh, limitation of interest deduction will not apply meaning to say that on a borrower or you know on insurance company or nbfcs or a bank on that uh, in section 94b does not apply then you have to say that is um, uh, you know is it engaged in the business of banking if you say yes then also it will not apply meaning to say that if you if you tell them that uh, you know it's in the interest of banking it's in the industry of banking then section 94b will not apply so basically you need an indian enterprise and the indian enterprise should not be in the business of banking insurance company notified uh, nbfc etc then you have to tell them that does the interest paid uh, exceed 1 crore rupees well if you say no then uh, uh, section 94b will not apply and that is because there is a threshold out there on section 94 the provision of this sorry the provision of this section would not be applicable where the interest expenditure uh, <clears throat> does not exceed 1 crore rupees. So this particular section will only be applicable if the interest is more than 1 crore rupees. So you tell them, is the interest more than 1 crore rupees? Well, yes. Well, then interest deduction uh, not allowed. Excess interest deduction will not be allowed. What is this excess interest deduction? That is what is provided. This is the excess interest. The interest payable uh, in excess of 30% of earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization, or the interest, whichever is lower, will actually be allowed as deduction. So what is this, uh, uh, you know, limited? Uh, what is this limit of 30%, etc.? I know it's very confusing. We'll discuss an example, and then we'll come back to the law and see what exactly does it say. So take a minute to look at this particular question and then we'll discuss this question going forward. Okay, read through this particular question here. Okay, so the question says that there is someone called ND Limited. It's an Indian company. It has borrowed 90 crores from TM, a company which is incorporated in London at the rate of 10%. <clears throat> so Indian company has taken a loan of 90 crores from another company and they have to give a rate of interest at 10%. The Indian company says that I'm going to repay it over five years and this particular loan is guaranteed by TY, which is incorporated in UK. Now, TD is a non-resident. They hold shares in 40% voting power in ND and TY incorporation. If you read through the last statement, it, said, it says that there is some TD incorporation. It's a non-resident. And this non-resident is holding 40% voting power in ND and 40% voting power in TY. So, you know, when you look at this particular statement that you know that ND and TY is related to each other. Why are they related? Because it's same person and this person is holding 40% shares in ND and this person is holding 40% shares in TY. So, that means you know that ND and TY are associated to each other. Now, what happens if they are associated to each other? Well, that basically means that ND has taken a loan from TM and the guarantee is given by ty so that basically means that this is within the purview of interest limitation of interest deduction they've taken a loan from their associated entity and what happens if you take a loan from your associated entity well there is section 94b and you have to make sure that the interest amount that you claim as deduction under pgbp that is limited now, they say that the net profit of ND is 11 crores after debiting interest, depreciation and income tax. Calculate the amount of interest to be allowed and claimed under PGBP in the computation of ND, giving appropriate uh, you know, reasons. So now you have to see what should be the amount of interest deduction that should be available. 
Well, if you want to look at the amount of interest deduction, let's start with something called the net profit. The net profit is 11 crore. But this net profit is, if you see, after debiting interest, depreciation, income tax. So what you do is you add interest, depreciation and income tax. Interest is 90 crores into 10%, 9, 9 crores. Depreciation is 5 crore and income tax is 4 crore. So that basically means that earning before interest, tax, depreciation and amortization is 29 crore. This was basically the earning. Now, what is, they say that, uh, you know, what is the amount of interest deduction? Well, the law says that the amount of interest deduction is total interest in excess of 30% of EBITDA. So that is the first statement. That means total interest, which is 9 crore minus 30% of EBITDA, 30% of 20 9 crore which is 8 crore 70,000. So the first uh, you know bullet point is total interest in excess of 30% of EBITDA which is 9 crore minus 870 which comes to 30 lakh. So this is going to become uh, you know 0 0.30. 30 lakh is written as 3.30. So the first bullet point was so the first bullet point was Total interest in excess of 30% of EBITDA, which is the first point, which is 30 lakh. The second point is interest paid or payable. Interest paid or payable to the AE is 9 crore. So it says this is available as deduction or this is available as deduction, whichever is less. Obviously, less in our example is 0 0.30. So meaning to say that only this much is available as a deduction. So if my Indian enterprise is paying an interest of 9 crore rupees to, to uh, you know, the associated enterprise, the entire 9 crore rupees is not going to be available as deduction under PGBP. The deduction under PGBP will be limited. And what will be the deduction under PGBP? Well, the deduction under PGBP will only, uh, you know, be this much. Interest allowed as deduction under uh, PGBP will be actually restricted. So that is how you discuss something called uh, interest limitation. What you have to understand under interest limitation is that if um, an Indian enterprise, just in summary, if an Indian enterprise has taken a loan from its associated enterprise, well, then the interest that they have to pay is going to be limited. The deduction will be limited in India. And what will be uh, the excess interest? Well, this will be the excess interest. The last topic that we have for today is something called penalties under transfer pricing. Before I actually move to penalties under transfer pricing, I want to tell you a very, very important statement that, um, uh, you know, these particular penalties under transfer pricing, they're always in above, over and above, uh, you know, the penalties that you have discussed separately in other topics. Um, so these are topics which are, this is penalty, which is very, very specific to, um, you know, transfer pricing. If you look at the penalties, they start from section 270A, which basically says that if you do not report an international transaction or you do not report a deemed international transaction, that will be considered as misreporting of income and the tax amount is going to be 200% of the tax payable on that particular uh, you know, transaction. If you do not furnish Form 3CEB or something which is called as an accountant's report or, you know, the transfer pricing return, well, the penalty will be 1 lakh. But this is 1 lakh straight up penalty, not uh, relating to the days. Then if the assessing officer asks you for information and you do not supply that information, then the penalty will be 2% of the value of international transaction. Then if you do not maintain CBCR or master file or etc., then the penalty is going to be 2% of the value of international transaction. But please note that, you know, the penalty, which is this one, which is if you do not maintain CBCR or, you know, uh, sorry, if you do not maintain master file or, you know, TP study, this particular penalty of 2%, this is over and above the penalty of this particular uh, of 1 lakh. So these are all penalties over and above, uh, you know, the penalties. 
further if you look at uh, you know the cbcr penalties they are also very very specific so if you do not furnish uh, you know those particular reports then the failure uh, will actually be uh, uh, you know 5000 rupees per day beyond one month it's going to increase to 15000 and then if you keep continuing to default then it's going to be 50000 similarly the penalties uh, if you do not produce information it's again going to be 5000 and going up to 50000 uh, per day if the default continues in that particular aspect if you look at cbcr the penalty for cbcr uh, you know inaccurate information in cbcr it's going to be 5 lakh rupees <coughs> altogether but you know if you actually put in a, a, a reasonable cause uh, for non levy of penalty if you put a reasonable cause out there then obviously uh, uh, you know there can be no levy of penalty but then uh, otherwise the penalty is quite high when it comes to transfer pricing but again i want to tell you that these penalties are over and above the uh, you know penalties that were discussed in uh, you know other sections going forward before we actually finish the lecture, I want to tell you a few, uh, you know, more things. When it comes to, uh, 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 when it comes to different topics, as I mentioned for CBCR, etc., uh, you know, there are definitions that are given given in the CA manual. Please go through those particular, uh, you know, definitions as well. Further, uh, uh, you know, I just ask you to go through the manual also. It's going to be very, very. Uh, you know, efficient, although I've covered, uh, uh, you know, all the examples, etc. from, uh, you know, the manual, but still it will be useful. Uh, as far as, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to take up a few topics now, just going to revise through those particular topics. The first topic that I have in mind is going to be safe harbor. Now, if you have any questions, uh, you know, I just ask you to post those questions on uh, the chat box and I will take them, take those questions one by one. So first is the concept on safe harbor rules. Well, the concept on safe harbor rules, as I mentioned, you know, were that there were these typical transactions in India typical transactions in this particular nature, software development services or, you know, information technology services, KPO services. And there was a lot of litigation in India in respect of these particular transactions. So, you know, the taxpayer always said that, listen, the margin from these typical transactions, if I do these transactions with my associated enterprise, it should be 5%. But the tax authority said that, no, no, it should be 10% at least. So there was a lot of litigation um, in terms of the margin from these particular transactions. So the income tax authorities, what they did was they came up with safe harbor rules. They said that we are defining these circumstances. When I say they are defining these, defining these circumstances, it basically means that they are defining that if you belong to this particular circumstance, like if you belong to the circumstance that the Indian enterprise is providing software development service, then the tax authority said that we are defining what is going to be the safe harbor what is going to be the margin that you should have so in other words they defined this circumstance they said that if you are if you are providing software development services to another entity if the indian entity is providing software development service or if the indian entity is providing information technology enabled service to another entity then your margin that you should have in india it should not be less than 20% or it should not be less than 22% depending on your, uh, uh, you know, uh, your uh, value of transaction. Then for ITES also, they define that it should not be less than 20%. It should not be less than 22%. Meaning to say that for all these transactions, if you see, you'll have to look at the rule. Uh, for all these rules, if you see, they've defined these particular circumstances and they've said that this is going to be the margin. It should not be less than that. If you are within this particular margin, it's absolutely safe and there will be no litigation in India for you. So what the income tax authorities have actually done is to define a safe harbor. When I say a safe harbor, they've defined a harbor limit which is more like 20%, 22%. And they said that this particular limit is safe for you. If you are falling in this particular limit, then there will be no uh, litigation for you in terms of this particular uh, margin and transaction. So they've defined, uh, you know, they've also gone to the extent of defining what are software development services, what are ITES, what are KPOs, etc. Uh, 
they have defined all these transactions, but they said that if you fall under this particular transaction, and for SDT, if you fall under supply of electricity, transmission of electricity, and these kind of transactions, then we have defined a safe harbor limit for you. That you know, this is the amount of uh, margin that you should actually earn in India. And if you earn this particular margin, then there will be we can assure you that there will be no litigation in terms of the margin and in terms of the percentage. So that is basically meant by safe harbor. They've given a safe harbor to the taxpayers in India. Uh, so that there is no litigation in India. There is another thing on secondary adjustment on repatriation. I am going to address that question. Uh, it says that repatriation within 90 days from which date? Well, this is rule 10 CB1 and it says repatriation should be within 90 days. In case uh, of the first situation that, you know, where the primary adjustment is accepted by the tax, uh, by the assessee. So, you know, <coughs> meaning to say that in our example, we were discussing of an example of secondary adjustment. And in that example, it said that, you know, the amount of repatriation is going to be 40 crores. Now, if this 40 crore is accepted by the assessee, well, then they'll have to repatriate this amount of 40 crores within 90 days of the due date of filing return of income under 139.1. So, due date of filing return of income within 90 days of that. If the primary adjustment is made by, you know, the assessing officer, so, you know, if generally the adjustment is made by the assessing officer in their assessing, uh, in their, uh, you know, order. So, now if the order says that, uh, uh, you know, there is a date in the order. Now, uh, if the primary adjustment is because of this particular order of the assessing officer, then you will have to make sure that the funds come to India or the funds are repatriated to India from within 90 days from the date which is paid, uh, you know, uh, mentioned in that particular order. So it is just provided in these particular instances that 90 days from which particular day. But what you have to remember that is that, that this is 90 days in respect of uh, repatriation. Um, another thing that I want to mention is that, uh, you know, when you actually go through APA, uh, uh, there are a lot of questionnaires that are that there, there is a lot of F FAQs, uh, frequently answered questions that were there by the CBDT, given by CBDT in terms of APS. Uh, they are provided in the ICAI study manual. Now that you've understood the concept of APA in uh, you know a very, very elaborate manner. So we've done what is APA benefits, what is the process, what are the fees, <clears throat> what are the validity, you know, revision, etc., cancellation. We've done all this. Now these FAQs will become very easy for you. So please, please, uh, you know, go through those particular FAQs also in the study manual. Uh, there was another question on secondary adjustment that if it is uh, treated as income, uh, uh, you know, well, if it is, it is treated as income, it is provided in, you know, as an adjustment. But the thing is that what, what is beyond that are, there's one thing to say. Uh, that, you know, there is a transfer pricing adjustment and the transfer pricing adjustment can go into litigation. But the point is that, um, uh, you know, is this money being adjusted in the, uh, uh, you know, the books of accounts of the Indian authority or not? And that is the reason we got secondary adjustment into place. That is it even accounted for? Is it even added to the books of accounts of the Indian assessee or the Indian taxpayer? And that is the reason uh, they came up with the concept of deemed loan. So as to make sure that, uh, you know, one, it is added to the books of accounts and it is repatriated. Well, if not, then it's going to become a deemed loan. So it's, it's, it's not as if the government is losing a revenue at all in this particular instance. No, the government is not losing, uh, you know, revenue in this particular instance. Please let me know if there are, uh, you know, any other questions. I'm just happy to answer them. 
otherwise uh, thank you so much for these amazing uh, you know three lectures they were very uh, you know good for me uh, i had a good time uh, uh, taking you through uh, the complexities of transfer pricing but if you have any questions uh, you know i'm happy to address them otherwise thank you so much and wishing you all the very best if you have any questions uh, beyond today also, please feel free to reach out to me and I'll be more than happy to answer those questions. Uh, I think there will be questions as in when you actually go through, um, uh, you know, topics in transfer pricing by yourself, uh, you know, when you go through the study manual, when you go through the PPTs, I'm sure that there will be questions. So you can reach out to me in future also and I'll be more than happy to address those questions. But for now, if there are questions, please let me know. Otherwise, all the very best and thank you so much. Uh, yes, um, I have a question here. If transfer pricing topic is completed, yes, transfer pricing topic is completed. Um, we did three lectures on transfer pricing. So in the first lecture, we did an introductory aspect. What are AEs? What is an international transaction? What is very important in transfer pricing are these methods. So we completed these six methods, um, uh, you know, in transfer pricing. We did this entire transfer pricing analysis. And today, uh, and today we uh, did some more issues in transfer pricing. So we discussed, you know, secondary adjustments, interest limitation, and then documentation, SDTs, etc. With this, we complete, uh, you know, transfer pricing. We have another question. LIBOR rate is applicable for year on year till repatriation. That is absolutely correct. Uh, if you do not repatriate, then this will be considered as deemed loan till the time it is repatriated. And till the time it is considered as a deemed loan, there will be obviously, uh, you know, interest that will be applicable. So it will be applicable year on year basis. That's absolutely correct. I'm waiting here for some more time to see if there are more questions. Um, after the lecture today, I'm going to uh, upload this PPT and obviously the PPT of the last lecture, I'm going to upload both these PPTs onto uh, you know, the portal so you can access those PPTs there. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed as well. Thank you. So we can stop the recording now.